Good morning, everybody. And in, where do I have to watch this? Uh, and in particular to those who are following uh, from remote. Uh, okay, uh, in this uh, fourth session of the conference, uh, our attention is devoted to um, rules and procedures on mediation and diversion in Mediterranean countries. As I said yesterday, the only criterion that we follow to uh, distribute the many speakers is a geographical one. But today we have as a first speaker, um, Dr. Alfredo Rizzo, who is a specialist in EU law and in EU uh, policies and actions. He's the author of several publications uh, about uh, European law, and not only that. He's currently a research, a senior research fellow at an institute, ENAP, in Rome. And he will uh, talk about the protection of the union's financial interests, a retrospective in perspective. Alfredo, you have the floor uh, because there are many speakers on the list. Uh, um, I will ask you to stick to the time allotted, which is 15, 15 maximo. 18 minuti. Um, Alfredo Rizzo was expected to be here in presence in Perugia, but he couldn't make it for uh, some problems. But I warmly welcome him, even though from far. Uh, Alfredo, you have the floor. Grazie. Thank you to you, Alessandra. Uh, I speak uh, directly in English for uh, all the uh, participants uh, today. Uh, I, do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Because I, I, I hear a sort of uh, echo, but uh, it, it's the audio, it's the uh, audio in the, in, in the room, in your room. Okay, I start immediately. Um, uh, okay, uh, I would say, uh, first of all, um, applying my competences uh, as a scholar uh, on EU law, basically, uh, in its uh, several uh, aspects and fields of application, that criminal law is, in, is an area that has been uh, called to support uh, the application of a range of unions policies. The main objective uh, of the action of the European Union in this area is in fact that of strengthening uh, law enforcement for the attainment of some specific goals of the treaties. This uh, is a name that stands beside the other objective of judicial cooperation as such which was already active and here and inner, inherent to the treaties in the area of civil and commercial law, starting 1968 and the, the Brussels Convention. Uh, this has been clarified as from the Maastricht reforms and through a significant political commitment proved in the European Council's meetings in Tampere, The Hague, and Stockholm in the 90s, last century. At the end of those political rounds, an agreement was reached between EU institutions and the national governments with the view of uh, making uh, EU criminal law a core area of EU action. Finally, this trend uh, was improved in the Lisbon Treaty, where all main topics concerning judicial cooperation mainly in the areas of civil and criminal law, though the first substance, substantive criminal law, though the first area civil law was already much developed, as I said before, uh, when EU criminal policy was in part integrated into the supranational EU decision-making framework. 
Someone has remarked that EU criminal law has had two principal historical, let's say, drivers for development. One aimed at securitizing the union as such, and the other with a functional approach to EU criminal policies and law in order to make such policies effective. However, the mentioned division is somewhat abstracted, as abstractly conceived when it comes considering the raising awareness at both institutional and governmental levels that the protection of EU financial interests is functional with specific EU interests detached from the national ones. Then the establishment of such aims in the treaties goes somehow in the same direction where provisions of co on competition policy go. There is, a, I, I will do a brief parallel between competition law and, uh, uh, and the protection of EU financial interests. In other words, there are some specific EU treaties provisions that address individuals' behaviors for the sake of specific interests and aims established in the treaties. In the half 80s, last century, a debate concerned the question on how competition rules as enshrined in the EC Treaty, Treaty on the European Community, might have been transposed in the Italian legal system, that is to say, by means of administrative law or, alternatively, by means of criminal law. In the end, the failure to provide for criminal sanctions in the 1990 Italian antitrust law can be traced back to a varied set of reasons. The same legal doctrine emphasized the strong tension with the principle of legality. The description of a case related to competition law, in fact, presents margins of ambiguity incompatible with the need to fully comply with the determination of the crime and the relevant need that same crime's consequences be assessed as much precisely as possible in legal terms and also for the sake of the protection of the uh, uh, criminal, let's say, of th those who commit the crime. It is known, however, that the same European Court of Human Rights, uh, in the context of the Council of Europe, as we know, has substantially applied the right to defense and the right to an effective remedy against the acts of the Commission aimed at sanctioning violations of competition rules of the treaty of the on the functioning of the European Union. Union. This exemplifies how the administrative measures aimed at implementing competition rules, although different in their effects, follow an approach that is theoretically similar to the, to the approach followed under criminal law. I will not prolong on this, obviously, because uh, those on competition law eventually are, at least uh, up to Lisbon, the only types of rules of the treaties at the treaties levels, so called the primary law of the Union, aimed at fighting contra legend behaviors under same treaties aims. Another story tells us what happens at the level of Union's legislative activity. In this area, it is a long standing practice of the legislative institutions to put in place acts and provisions that entail specific obligations directly in the national legal system via the implementation of such rules on the part of, of national authorities. The direct effects of EEC regulations, of regulations of the European, under the European Community Treaties into member states' legal systems implies, implied, has implied, as still implies, under the different context of the, the European Union Treaty and, and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, that same states must grant so-called effectiveness under the FAUTIL criterion to relevant provisions enshrined into such legal sources. 
This was cle clearly stated ever since the Amsterdam bulb case, uh, we speak of the 70s, when the Court of Justice of the European Union for the first time of the European communities, for the first time referred to Article 5 of the treaties on the European communities, corresponding to current Article 4 of the treaty uh, on the, on the, of the European Union, dealing with the duty of a fair cooperation for the national authorities, being such authorities forced to take all appropriate measures, whether general or particular, to ensure the implementation of European community rules. The case dealt in particular with the NEC regulation on the international marketing, marketing of flowers bulbs. In that context, the same court acknowledged that such objective might be pursued also by means of sanction with the criminal law meaning in accordance with each member state's legal system and legislation. These words made even more clear in the Greek maze case, very well known on the, uh, and very uh, crucial, central for our topics. However, this case was much more specific and clearly indicated the characters, although in a broad sense, of national measures aimed at implementing re relevant obligations under a legislative act of the European community. Indeed, for the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, such national measures should be effective, proportionate and dissuasive, and in addition, the aims pursued under relevant Union Act should be assimilated under relevant national acts for the implementation of, si of the said Union's obligation. Is everything clear so far? May I go on? Is, is that okay? Okay. In the you end... The court... five more minutes remaining. Okay. In the end, the court agreed with the Commission. Under the duty of sincere cooperation, the member states are required, that is to say forced, to say forced, to penalize any persons who infringe community law in the same way as they penalize those who infringe national law. The case dealt with due payments to the commission of the agricultural levies, uh, levies, uh, levies uh, on the imports of Yugoslav maize together with the fault interest. In the course reasoning, a clear re reference was made to criminal law as a feasible tool for member states to make obligations stemming for EU legislative acts, uh, from EU legislative acts, fully effective, util again, criterion, in their national legal system. Moreover, the case is also significant for us because it referred to frauds against specific community interests, that is to say, the duty for the interested national government to correspond to the Commission, the agricultural levies on the imports of Yugoslav maize, as such imports were at the time specifically regulated under legislative act of the community and were meant as communities' own resources. Together with the fault interests, moreover, in fact, the Greek government omitted to specify that the same quotas of maize commercialized from Greece into the European community market came from former Yugoslavia instead of being produced directly in Greece. In few words, much before the Lisbon reforms and even before the introduction of Article 280 of the Treaty on the European Community, the Court of Justice, of Justice of the Union classified specific economic financial interests pertaining to the community as such and coming from specific communities policies, in the case at hand, agricultural policy. Indeed, ever, seen, ever since 1970, the Council of the European Community designated the customs duty and agricultural levies as communities' first types of own resources. 
as in the case of European coal and steel community levy levies, the rate and the base of these traditional own resources are set by EU institutions and they are charged directly on economic agents, thus creating a direct tax-like fiscal link between the community and indiv individual or corporate citizens. One should not forget, in addition, that such resources meant as specifically due to the community as such come from a commission proposal for a draft amendment to the treaty dating back from 1976 uh, and aimed at permitting the adoption of common rules on the protection under criminal law of the financial interests of the communities and the prosecution for, of, infringements, uh, of infringements of the provisions of, the, of those treaties. This is a proposal of the directive back in 1976. These are, in few words, the fundamentals of the two, uh, 2013 Commission's proposal for the establishment of the APPO, specifically competence, to investigate on infringements of the Union financial interests. We should, however, not forget that, beside such ambitious aims, the Court of Justice, mainly in support of the Commission, built the, the independence of such interests from the national ones, assigning to member states sufficient room on how to implement the protection of those aims. In this context, a fait utile doctrine remains central to understand the EU approach in this area. Indeed, for the court, the relevant EU legislation is aimed inter alia at granting equivalence between the penalties foreseen at the national level for infringements of financial interests of the state and the penalties, penalties that, that must be applied at the same national level for infringements of EU financial interests. Uh, one question. Okay. You should okay. Uh, I, I will uh, go. Uh, I will conclude in uh, just one minute. One question comes to my mind, considering above general framework: Is this framework still valid under under current developments? And in particular, is the objective of protecting EU financial interests by means of BPO getting closer than the past? It is a a, a matter, let's say, of considering how this policy has developed, developed so far. Indeed, we see still, still some tensions uh, for the achievement of these goals. And I saw particularly this uh, tension uh, concretely uh, arising in the case uh, of the uh, adoption of the directive on the fight against fraud affecting the union's financial interests in 2017. Because in that case, instead of making reference to Article 325 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which is specifically devoted to the protection of the Union's financial interests, in that case, the uh, um, institutions, political institutions, the legislative institutions of the Union um, chose to make reference as a legal basis of this directive to Article 83 of the Treaty of the, on the Functioning of the European Union, which is a, 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 an article specifically de devoted to uh, cooperation on uh, criminal law for the attainment of specific uh, interests and objective, objectives of the European, uh, European Union. I see this uh, approach from the political institutions uh, a little, uh, a bit, uh, um, I, we should uh, reflect better on this choice uh, because in that case there was a specific legal basis uh, provided by the treaty for the institutions. And the question is why the institutions chose to make reference to a broader rule of the, of the treaty, yes, uh, considering that this uh, rule of the treaty, chosen specifically as a legal basis for this act, uh, uh, allows to member states to make recourse 
to a um, uh, to a um, uh, uh, to a um, uh, to uh, um, uh, in Italian, or uh, leaves, however, for any member states of the Council to submit a request to the European Council to suspend the legislative procedure. So the, the member states, in the case of Article 83, have a, have a much more uh, greater possibility to suspend the legislative procedure. So this is, uh, this uh, uh, um, proves in a, in a way that member states the member states have more room uh, under the current uh, developments, uh, political developments, have more room uh, to uh, put uh, their request on the plate and, and, uh, and uh, still in a way or another um, endanger or um, uh, uh, Rallentare uh, the legislative process, lowering the legislative process uh, in the in the in, in this area of uh, uh, criminal law cooperation. Sorry for prolonging, and uh, there is so much more to discuss. Uh, I hope I can I can intervene in, uh, in further for additional comments. Yes, you will. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alfredo, for the, um, your presentation in which you uh, precisely highlighted, among other uh, elements, the, the fact that the legal basis for the adoption of the fifth direction, uh, uh, directive has been um, a different uh, provision than Article 325 because of the reluctancy of some states to accept uh, a full union's competence in this field. Uh, I hope you will remain with us connected to this room um, because I gather that after during the debate there will be some questions um, to you and we yes. will further develop your um, presentation in the written form in the proceedings. We're looking forward to it. So now uh, we move on to the examination of the Spanish legislation. And for that, we have uh, two distinguished professors. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Miriam Kugat Mauri which we see on the screen, yes. And the second one is Natalia uh, Perez-Rives, which we also, whom we also see now. Um, uh, I must say that the, the Spanish group of researchers which participated to the Trump project did a very thorough work and um, a complete uh, analysis of the Spanish law and uh, procedure on our issue. Uh, the report in the English version uh, is uh, already uploaded in the website drum.eu. Um, so now uh, our first speaker, uh, Miriam Kugat, is professora titular de derecho penal, directora del servicio de estudios y dictámenes jurídicos, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. She is a professor, full professor of um, criminal law and the director of uh, the service of legal studies of the University uh, of Barcelona. Miriam will talk about the possibilities of plea agreement in EPOS prosecutions. Uh, Miriam, thank you for being with us. She wanted to come to Perugia, but due to the difficulty in flight connections, she had to give her presentation from remote. I hope you will come next time. And the same for Natalia. And uh, you have the floor. Uh, should try to stick within uh, 15, max 18 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. 
Um, good morning. And well, first of all, it is for me a pleasure and an honor to take part in this relevant event. And I thank Professor Alessandra Renciotti and Avocato Maria Pisani for inviting me to participate in it, as well as my dear colleague, Professor Vico Valentini, for suggesting my name in this way, promoting co collaboration between international and criminal law experts. The subject of my talk would be the possibilities of plea agreements in proceedings involving the EPO. By this, I mean a system of early termination of criminal proceedings in which the accused consents to plead guilty to a lesser charge. But first, I would like to justify why we should deal with plea agreement as an alternative or restorative means of justice in the sense of the Directive uh, 2012 on the rights uh, of uh, victims of crime or the recommendation of the Council of Europe of 2018 um, on restorative justice. In fact, uh, the characteristics of plea agreement in Spain seem opposed to the aims of restorative justice. A plea agreement is not exactly a complementary bias or an alternative measure of criminal proceedings, but a mere way of shortening them. Second, in opposition to the mentioned recommendation of the Council of Europe of 2018, it does not recognize the legitimate interest of victims to have a stronger voice regarding their response to their victimization, to communicate with the offender and to obtain reparation and satisfaction within the justice process. As the three causes would be, uh, first of all, they can only intervene if they are party to the process, the victim, only if it's party to the process, what it is not always the case in Spain. Second, wh when it is so, and when the victim is a party to the process, can only authorize the lawyer to negotiate on, they, on he, his or her behalf and subsequently approve the outcome of the negotiation. And third, the purpose of the negotiation is not to repair the damage caused by the crime, although this is an effective way both for the accused and the victim to conclude the agreement. Going back to the reasons by, uh, that explain this opposition between uh, our system of plea agreement and the aims of the recommendation on restorative justice, Finally, we can see that uh, this mechanism, it does not consider the offender's sense of responsibility, offering them opportunities to make amends, which may further their reintegration, enable redress and mutual understanding and encourage desistance from crime. As the purpose of the accused acknowledgement of the facts is not his or her resocialization, but the saving of procedural time in the taking of evidence. In short, the purpose of plea agreement is to speed up the procedure and not for repairing the harm to the victim or the resocialization of the perpetrator. Nevertheless, it can serve to introduce elements of restorative justice in criminal proceedings in Spain when it is combined with mediation that is the subject of a uh, Professor Natalia Pérez Rivas' speech. Uh, this is important as a um, plea agreement is widely used in Spain and can be applied to proceedings where the EPO is involved. Now, I would like to share with you um, an image, very quickly, of course, just to show in a graphic way the importance of a plea agreement in the pr practice in Spain. 
And if, according to statistics, 50% uh, of criminal procedures end by plea agreement, and this represents 70% of convictions. And uh, this so extended plea agreement could be applied to proceedings where the EPO is involved, according to Articles 109 and 110 of the law creating the EPO in Spain, that is the law 9 slash 221, under the condition that the offense is punished that with no more than six years of imprisonment, which is the case of most of the crimes referred in the Directive 2017-1371. And uh, I think of, and now I will, uh, I, I'm not going to share any, any more that, just to come back to the image. Uh, so, uh, um, crimes as fraud in respect of procurement or non-procurement related expenditures, money laundering, corruption or embezzlement, with the only exclusion of a specific serious cases of embezzlement punished with a, a, um, more than six years of imprisonment in Spain. Future outlook just to finish. In the event that the ongoing procedural reform is approved in Spain, the maximum limit of six years that limits the possibilities of pre-agreement could be abolished, which would open, it, open the possibilities of pre-agreement for all crimes, including for aggrava aggravated embezzlement. Second, the problem uh, could arise in minor cases than, that in Spain, following the European Directive, are those of frauds between 10,000 and 100,000 euros. If the principle of opportunity that it could widen arrive to these minor cases in relative terms. And finally, the possibilities of plea agreement could also increase if the new, um, uh, the, the ongoing draft on the reform of the criminal procedure um, law was gave the faculty to the public prosecutor to suggest the reduction of the penalty, uh, um, improving the possibilities of an agreement be between the victim and the accused. I hope I, I was on time, on, my, on the time I was given, and thank you again for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam, for your um, presentation. And also the statistic you showed us was very effective to illustrate the Spanish situation, having highlighted that uh, plea agreement is largely used and is primarily aimed at the speeding up the administration of justice. And uh, now to complete the uh, overview on the Spanish legislation, we give the floor to Professor Natalia Perez Rivas, who is Assistant Professor in Criminal Law in the University of Santiago de Compostela. She will uh, tackle uh, the topic of restorative justice in socioeconomic and corruption crimes. Natalia, thank you for your intervention, and you have the floor. Very much. Uh, first, first of all, uh, congratulations to the organizers for this great uh, Congress. I am going to share a um, presentation. Which I like, like. Uh, strictly speaking, um, the Spanish legal system doesn't regulate alternative restorative justice instruments to adult uh, criminal proceedings. 
it doesn't even exist a specific legal uh, regulation uh, regarding the restorative justice procedure. Only one article due with uh, general provisions. Um, this lack of regulation has a positive aspect. Uh, this allows uh, to innovate, to be imaginative, and to try to provide a better uh, restorative response in areas of crime, uh, different of uh, those to which uh, restorative justice is uh, traditional apply. This includes offense uh, that protects super individual legal interests, which is precisely the type of offense that uh, fall within the material competence of the European Public Prosecutor Office. Um, is the response of the traditional penal system uh, to these crimes satisfactory? My opinion, no. Um, no, for the following reasons. Uh, the owner of this um, super individual legal interest, for example, socioeconomic order, um, public administration, is the society as a whole. However, neither society nor the associations acting on its behalf are recognized as victims and consequently uh, cannot appear in the proceeding as private collective accusation. The European Union through the Public Prosecutor Office uh, will assume uh, the procedural representation of the protect uh, legal interests. It weakens our sense of community and make us invisible as victims. In second place, the damage uh, resulting for these crimes is almost never direct or economic in nature. They are mainly social, indirect and diffuse. And third, there, are, there is no channel for claiming reparation liability, uh, for, for, sorry, for claiming reparation for the social damage caused by these crimes, and they remain invisible. Civil liability is only recognized for individuals identified when it's proven that they have suffered damage as a direct and uh, necessary consequence of the criminal act. In view of this, uh, restorative justice as a complement uh, to and with the first uh, on the criminal process could be presented in these cases as a different, um, more complete way to, uh, of dealing with the crime. However, uh, this possibility presents uh, several uh, difficulties in relation with the victim and in relation with the damage. So uh, the implementation of restorative practice to this type of crime, supra-individual uh, uh, crimes requires the, the following issues uh, to be addressed. The concept of uh, restorative justice, the uh, legitimacy to participate in restorative encounters, the redefinition of the damage, and the uh, most appropriate restorative practice. Uh, restorative justice is identified uh, with a specific uh, restorative practice victim offender mediation. In view of this, uh, some authors consider that it's not possible to apply restorative justice in those cases in which they are not identified individual victims as in the crimes that we are uh, analyzed. The recommendation 2018 uh, advocates a broad concept, concept of restorative uh, justice. Uh, they said that uh, restorative justice usually, but not always, takes the form of a dialogue, direct or indirect, between the victim and the offender, and may also involve, where appropriate, other persons directly or indirectly affected by the crime. For example, the community. We must be in mind that only when all three sets of primary stakeholders Victim, offender, and community are actively involved, such in conference and in circles, is a process fully restorative. Um, why only a natural person as victim in restorative justice? Uh, the Directive 2012 defined victim as a natural person who has suffered harm which was directly caused by the criminal offence. And the Court of Justice of the European Union in 2010 held that the concept of victim doesn't include legal persons for the purpose of promoting mediation in the criminal cases. This uh, restrictive interpretation of the term victim in the field of restorative justice is due, among others, to the uh, 
following reasons. The crime in this area has been representing as a violation of one individual against another, which appeal to a personal victimization, and the positive effects of uh, restorative justice for the victim have also traditionally focused on psychological or emotional benefits. However, in the uh, procedural field, the defense of supra-individual legal interests can be exercised by uh, associations or groups representing the community. For example, a platform for tax justice, platform against private cor corruption, environmental associations, etc. This possibility is provided by both international and national uh, law. In the Spanish criminal proceeding, the natural way to bring uh, supra individual interest into the process is through the popular action, popular, popularist action. But it's a decisive subject uh, to important restrictions. It cannot support criminal charges alone. Bail must be provided, and maybe the most important, it cannot bring civil action. If the purpose of the directive is to provide a high level of protection for victims of crime, it should be possible to recognize uh, those rights for all victims, regardless of whether they are natural or legal person, or the, uh, if the victimization happen as a result of an uh, individual or collective crime. In this sense, victims of crimes uh, with supra-individual legal interests uh, should be adequately represented in restorative encounters. So we understand that uh, in addition to those, uh, to those individuals or groups who have been directly harmed by the offense, the traditional victim, uh, it must recognize the legitimacy to participate in these uh, restorative meetings to the representative of the collective interest and those individuals or groups who have suffered indirect or collateral damage. Uh, with regard to the association that representing the collective interest, it's uh, necessary, to, uh, necessary to determine what conditions uh, must be met by these uh, uh, agrupations. Uh, the regulation of uh, environmental associations in the civil sphere is uh, illustrative in this respect. So, its corporate purpose must be closely related to the legal uh, interest that has been damaged. The association uh, must be uh, legally constituted and registered uh, prior to the commission of the offense. And territorial scope, maybe geographical community, maybe community of identity. In relation with this uh, last concept, for example, uh, Transparency International, uh, Group of States Against Corruption, etc. Uh, in relation with the uh, object of uh, restorative encounters, uh, the damage resulting from these crimes uh, are mainly social, indirect and diffuse. But the reparation is outside the criminal process. Here, uh, lies the great potential of the application of restorative justice to crime that protects uh, supra-individual interests. So the damage is the damage that suffered the collectivity. Material, for example, financial costs associated with improper payments that uh, public officials receive, as they say, bribery, or intangible uh, damage. For example, potential decrease in the economic income of the population, reduction of the foreign investments, deficient provision of basic public service, etc. All those entitled to intervene in restorative encounters uh, could contribute to, first, determine the damage in a broad sense that's uh, caused by this kind of offense and propose. Uh, the actions that they will consider appropriate to repair the damage uh, caused to the society. It's a, de a, a deliber deliberate, deliberative reparation. For example, uh, what measures should be taken by the offended company to avoid uh, a repetition of the offenses, uh, community fines, to give a specific destination to the confiscation, etc. Uh, as far as the restorative practice to be implementing in these cases, uh, two basic aspects uh, must be taken into account in its choice. It should be socially uh, 
restorative and the community should be uh, develop an active role in the uh, restorative process. For these reasons, the conference or circles are the most appropriate restorative practice from uh, our point of view. Uh, they allow uh, for the participation of a large number of people representing the interests of those involved in the crime without being direct victims or perpetrators, uh, giving access to the restorative encounters to the community uh, would make society co-responsible, co would generate networks and collective links, would involve the, commun the community or the society in the solution of the issues that affect us, and would make visible to the perpetrator the damage resulting from his her action. The crimes with a victim doesn't exist. And finally, how to link restorative justice, public prosecution, and criminal proceedings? Um, restorative justice can act as an effective complement to the exercise of a opportunity principle. Um, at this respect, an interesting uh, provision is ambitious in a preliminary draft law on criminal procedure, uh, procedure code in, in Spain. Um, at this, this regard, the public prosecutor assessing the agreements reached by the parties, by all the parties, direct victims, offenders, and community, uh, the concurrent circumstance and the status of the procedure may decree the file by opportunity, and imposing as rules of conduct the agreements reached by all these uh, parties or proceed according to the special rules of plea uh, agreement that uh, explained uh, my colleague, uh, the professor uh, Kugat. In any case, uh, the adoption of a specific leg uh, legislation on restorative justice in criminal matters in Europe and in Spain as suggested by uh, recommendation 2018 and the Venice Declaration, uh, clarifying these issues uh, is, uh, is essential. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to uh, Natalia Perez Rivas for this uh, interesting presentation uh, that highlighted the, the importance to uh, involve all the parties in the uh, restoration process and in the conferencing of all the parties. Uh, now we switch from Spain to Portugal and we have here with us in present at the end, he, uh, Dr. Diago Sergio Cabral, who is invited lecturer at the Law School of the University of Mino, did I pronounce it correctly, who is a PhD candidate in the same university and he's studying um, the issue. He will broach um, the EPPO functioning from a peculiar position, which is that of Portugal, where something happened when the, um, the Portuguese prosecutor was to be appointed. Uh, Tiago, you have the floor and you will tell us more about this interesting story. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank uh, the organization and the University of Perugia and Professor Alessandra, which is right by me for the kind invitation to be here. I'd like also to thank all the people that are watching us both uh, at home through Zoom, but especially the ones that are here and especially the ones that uh, went to the dinner yesterday that was quite late and I, are here in the morning. I promise that I'll keep my time because I'm the only person between you and the coffee break and I know that's uh, not a good place to be and I'm sure that you have plenty of questions for the other uh, speakers which were very interesting indeed. This is indeed a peculiar way of um, approaching things because I could pretty much do this entire presentation in two or three words. I could just say everything went wrong and then allow you to, to go home but I'll explain it a bit more. 
Uh, my presentation, as the title points, will be about the appointment of the Portuguese European prosecutor, prosecutor and how this affected the confidence of, uh, in the EPPO in Portugal. Well, let's, uh, well, I have a piece of technology here that should allow me, yes. Um, let's speak about how things should work or how things are designed, because uh, there was no illegality, there was no unlawful behavior as far as it's still uh, investigated and things are still being addressed, as we'll see after uh, in the Court of Justice. But things should work pretty much like this, and it is, this is how it was designed. According to Article 16, uh, 16 of the EPPO regulation, each member state shall nominate three candidates for the position of European prosecutor. And there are three main requirements for the position. Well, they have to be a member of the public prosecution services, service or the judiciary. They have to be independent, which is natural and regular. I mean, if they are uh, members of the European public, of the public prosecution service, at least in Portugal, it's, they'll likely be independent. And then they have to possess the qualifications required to a high prosecutorial uh, or judicial office in their respective member states and have relevant practical experience uh, of national legal systems, financial investigations, and international judicial cooperation in criminal matters. So these are uh, substantive criteria that any candidate must fulfill. Well, and then we, we, we start coming to the interesting part because, well, yes, after uh, the nomination by the national government, by the member state, uh, the, um, the selection panel, which is a selection panel that exists, I think they are created under Article 14, number three of the PPO regulation, but I may be slightly wrong in the number, uh, but they rank uh, the, the nominated uh, people in one, two, three. It's pretty much a seriation. Uh, based on how they believe that who is the better candidate for the job. But this is a ranking. This is not an exclusion, you know, unless there is a possibility for an exclusion if the selection panel believes that uh, the candidate does, does not feel, fulfill those minimum requirements. This, this will generally not be the case. Generally, all the candidates will fulfill the requirements. They'll be independent. They'll have some experience or at least enough experience to do the job, but some will be better than others. So, and um, this is quite important because it will be, it will be a matter in the Portuguese case. What we need to, to keep in mind, and I'm sure that most of you already know, but for those who do not, is that this is not a veto power. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this is not a veto power. This is not binding on the council. This is just, if you are not good enough for the job, if you do not have the qualifications, we can reject you. But if you have in abstract the qualifications, then the decision goes to the council, who is the one who appoints the European public prosecutor, in this case, the Portuguese one. And now we go to the council, which is, as I stated, the institution that appoints the European public prosecutor. And there's, there's a difference here, um, or there, there's an interesting point here, is that the council, um, by design, or European institutions work a bit differently and lawmaking institutions including, and there's a great difference between the council and the European parliament, which is by design, the council sees itself more as a diplomatic meeting or then um, an European institution lawmaking body. The, the council um, is also by design not the most transparent institution. Uh, there is a long-standing feud between uh, the Council and the Parliament and uh, public opinion regarding meetings in the Council and now they are not, for example, live streamed, how you do not have access to uh, the um, 
I'm missing the word now, but uh, to the to the meetings themselves in writing, um, how um, and how those procedures are not considered to be the most transparent in comparison, for example, for example, with the European Parliament, which everything is live streamed. Uh, this is uh, especially a problem in uh, in Trello meetings, uh, but. Let's let 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 let's let's go 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 back to point. Um, the European Public Prosecutor is not supposed to be a political appointment. In fact, uh, it should not, because if it was, you would not you would have a problem with uh, independence, which is one of the main criteria. And uh, the Portuguese Public Prosecutor, the one who was nominated in the end, which was uh, Dr. José Guerra, and Something that I like to say, I don't know Dr. José Guerra, I'm sure this is a very competent person and he was seriated in seconds, so he's certainly, he's certainly capable for the job. So I'm criticizing the, the, the appointment, but it's not something about the person in particular. But in his first interview as a uh, European public prosecutor, uh, Portuguese European public prosecutor, he pointed out that one of the things that the EPPO could do was uh, pursue fraud of national politicians. This is a big problem in Portugal, and we'll see this a bit later when I speak about how the media jumped on the case. Um, And there's another thing uh, that, that we should take into account in how this procedure is designed. By not by giving all the power to the council, there's no uh, parliamentary, or the, parliament, the European Parliament does not have an opinion on this one. It's just the council, unlike with the chief prosecutor in which the council and the European Parliament must be in agreement. Um, in this one, the council decides by itself the council will probably, or the members of the council will probably not want to open a diplomatic role if a certain member state pushes for a candidate, which was pretty much what happened here. And there are two reasons for, for this one. Uh, first, uh, let's, let's state it plainly. Unless um, there are serious signs of misgivings or foul play, um, you will not want to lose an ally that may help you in future votes because uh, the national government is pushing for the second person instead of the first or the third instead of the first. This is just how negotiation and real, polit real politics work in the council. Second, well, you are not really, uh, if you are a member of another member state, which could pretty much raise the red flag and this is the vote, so they could in theory force uh, and they should, in fact, if this is how it is designed, uh, force the um, most qualified, the uh, best ranked candidate uh, to, be, to be appointed. But if you are a member of the council from another member state, you assume that the ones who know better, the three candidates that they nominated, are the members of the member state that nominated them. So even with, the, with a different opinion from the selection procedure, it's likely that you'll follow what's stated by, your, by the original government. Well, I already addressed this one. There's no European Parliament here. So let's go to the Portuguese case. In Portugal, or uh, in the case of the, non the appointment of the Portuguese European Public Prosecutor, there, is a, there was divergence in opinion between the selection committee and the Portuguese government. While the selection committee considered Ana Almeida the best qualified candidate, the opinion of the Portuguese government favored uh, the candidate placed in second that was eventually appointed, that was Dr. Zaguer. After uh, the results of the, after the opinion of the selection committee was known, the Portuguese government sent a letter contesting uh, the rankings established by the selection com committee to the general secretary of the council. In particular, the Portuguese government argued in favor of José Guerra, of Dr. José Guerra, based on his long career in, public in the public prosecutor service in Portugal, experience in complete complex, case complex cases related to uh, criminal prosecution and fraud, um, especially, 
and the opinion of the Superior Council of the Portuguese Public uh, Prosecutor, who also analyzed the candidates before in the context of the nominations and actually rang, ranked Professor uh, Dr. José Eguerra in first. In the end, uh, the Council ended up appointing José Guerra, the, the candidate of the government, which was not placed first by the Selection Committee for, uh, Portuguese, uh, for Portuguese European Public Prosecutor. Uh, Let's, let, let's see something, something that's important to know. Portugal was not the only country where this happened. In fact, there are two more cases which are in Bulgaria and Belgium. Uh, but I believe that Portugal was the one that was more, uh, that uh, had more attention. I'll explain why in a bit. Uh, currently there's an appeal or there's an running in the court of justice against the appointment of the Portuguese public prosecutor. It's case C576-21P. Uh, uh, if anyone wants, wants to check out the case. And it's an appeal from a decision of the general court regarding an, a an action for annulment, uh, which the general court rejected due to the fact that uh, it was not presented in time. A similar appeal by the Belgium candidate was already decided by the Court of Justice and it was rejected. I personally think that the appeal by the Portuguese appeal will also be rejected because the foundations are very similar to the Belgium one. Uh, the decision of the Court of Justice was, was pretty much this is a discretionary uh, matter of the Council and the um, and the, the, the procedure was complied with. Now, let's see how the media had a field day with this. Uh, there are some context, context, context that I should give you so you, so you can see, uh, and I'll, I'll now give you the juicy bits, but first the context. Uh, this happened at a very delicate time uh, in Portugal due to various reasons. First, uh, Portugal was uh, beginning its presidents of the council, the ro rota rota rotating presidents of the council. Um, so there was a lot of fo focus on European matters in Portugal at this time. Second, uh, the justice minister was uh, eroded, like confidence in her was pretty much eroded. She's not very popular, or she was not, she was already replaced, very popular in Portugal, uh, especially in legal circles. Third, um, confidence in the public prosecutor, the national public prosecutor in Portugal is also at a low point, I'd say, uh, mostly because of a mix of two things. First, uh, there was a sense of impunity in cases related to fraud by politicians, uh, mostly. But then uh, the public prosecutor actually started to act. And there were a lot of uh, politicians who were accused and brought to court. The problem is that the public prosecutor lost most of the cases. So things, uh, most, most really. So things got even worse. They were... They were. They are starting to be seen as ineffective, which is not always a fair, a fair statement, I'd say. Uh, and there's one more point in this specific case, which was that letter that I spoke to you about, um, that the Portuguese government sent to the council. It had some. Depending on whom you believe, if you believe the media and the opposition, it would be lies. If you believe the government, it would be uh, small mistakes regarding the career of Dr. José Guerra. First, there were some points in which it was stated that uh, Dr. José Guerra led, for example, the biggest criminal investigation team inside the public prosecutor in Portugal, which is not true. Uh, it was not the biggest. It was a big one, but not the biggest. The second, that we was responsible for the largest case related to financial fraud in Portugal, which was like 10 to 15 years ago, uh, and it was not. It was one of the people on the team, but it was actually not responsible for, for, the, for the, the team. And this is a letter that was drafted by the Justice Minister in Portugal and sent to the Council, so it would be expected for it to be double-checked and triple-checked before uh, you send this kind of communication. 
according to the Portuguese government, and I must say this, they, this, this did not affect the selection procedure, the appointment procedure. Then things escalated quite quickly. Uh, in the previous slide, let me see, I put two pieces of news, but there were dozens. This was really very much spoken about in Portugal. Then you have the international news uh, in which it was picked not only by the media, uh, but when, when Politico starts speaking about Portugal, you know that something went wrong because generally it's what, what, what happens. Um, but you, you had a number of legal experts, including a number of legal, legal experts who actually sent an open letter contesting the decision, both in Portugal, Belgium, and Bulgaria. Uh, you had the European Parliament actually publicly, um, publicly uh, complaining uh, about the decision and uh, criticizing the Portuguese government and the council uh, because of how the procedure was uh, conducted in a, in a very, very wide vote, so with a, with a large majority, um, and uh, stating that there were indeed lies and the procedure was not the proper one. And you even have had European on, on Budsman, um, pretty much stating that uh, she was worried about how the procedure was conducted. Again, uh, this happens when Portugal is starting the rotating presidents of the council. <clears throat> so, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll. I'll just conclude. I, I, I promise that I'll keep with my time and I probably, I probably spoke too much already. Uh, so uh, we can already see the impact of how we can already see and we can, I'm, I'm not a statistician and unfortunately I don't have like a statistic uh, study where people uh, answered how did this affect your confidence in the EPBO as an institution or as a body in general. It's not possible it was not made in Portugal, or maybe it's a project for the future. Uh, but it's quite easy to see that uh, when you are starting a new type of project and new type of legal creation, which we expect to be very important and to be the first step for more integration in um, criminal and criminal cooperation matters, if you start on the wrong foot, things would will go wrong. And one of exam one particular example is the first interviews of uh, the appointed Portuguese public prosecutor, Professor Dr. José Guerra, who were actually speaking about appointment procedure, not about what uh, the PPO could do in Portugal, but about the polemic uh, regarding, regard, regard, regarding it. And the other issue is that uh, immediately the PPO was in Portugal pretty much put in the same bag as national public prosecutor. prosecutor. Um, ineffective, probably, and uh, also controlled by the politicians. Um, I'm not stating that this is true about the National Public Prosecutor, because I actually believe that it's not. I believe they like resources, but they actually do a great effort with what they have. But this is public opinion. Public opinion matters very, pretty very much. Uh, and then you have uh, how this kind of case will uh, affect the relationship of the normal citizen with the European Public Prosecutor. Um, so this is pretty much the story that I have to bring to you because I'm already over time. Uh, so if you want to develop this a bit more, I'll be open for questioning and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Tiago Cabral for this interesting story which uh, opens the field to questions and debate. Uh, so I ask if, uh, if there is any question, if, I, if somebody from here wants to uh, make questions. Also, uh, participants attending online, uh, this morning we, we do see if you raise your and uh, through the computer. So if anybody wants to ask questions to uh, the speakers of this first panel, including uh, uh, Professor Kugat and uh, Professor 
uh, Natalia uh, Perez Rivas, uh, feel free to ask. Doman? Yes. Uh, get the microphone, please. Uh, 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 they need the microphone, otherwise they don't hear you. Alfredo. I don't know where, where we met Salve. each other. We met you already. Si, we met. Yes. We met, I think. Uh, I, I can hear you, but I don't see you. Uh, okay, <laughs> how are you? I well, that, that's yes, I, I can hear you, but I don't see you. Okay, uh, I'm not so you photogenic. Know don't, you don't need to I, see, I see me. No, I see uh, your back. Only one, uh, just to say, when you talk about general topic like the protection of the peace, I would suggest you, excuse me, eh, because from young people, young lawyer, uh, I expect vision. Uh, so next time, excuse me, uh, from my age, I can give you some, some advice. Two and a half minutes the past, two and a half minutes the present, 50 minutes the vision for the future. Mm. Because what you, talk, what you said about assimilation, is ripe for the waste. This, uh, it was uh, uh, the ruling of 69 on mice Greek, on mice, uh, Greek mice, it was Yugoslav mice. And uh, assim this is, uh, assimilation doesn't work. Doesn't work because many members, are, not many, certain member states do not care about public money. So the, the assimilation is not enough to protect the European fund, you know. Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, yeah. Arm, uh, then uh, directive, we have now the directive which goes farther, which is, the, uh, is to bring to closer together the protection is harmonization. We are at level of manifestation with directive. But the problem that the object of the directives is implemented by national legislation, uh, it, it will not significantly improve the coherence of the legal environment in which public prosecutor office will have to work. Because given the latitude given to the member state, they will, uh, tra the transposition will be very different from one country to another and undermine the effectiveness of prosecution. We need for the, given the hybrid architecture of the public prosecutor, we need instrument of synthesis which give the possibility to work on unified environment. So I am proposing a regulation and you find the legal base. So the European, if the regulation which uh, exactly determine which should be the, the crime and the punishment, so they have a, an harmonized, you have a unique instrument to be applied for the uh, for by by the EPPO and not uh, twenty five different legislation, causing foreign shopping and so on, and because of the past has shown that uh, the is that uh, obligation members to establish effective proportion does not work. Um, I would recommend then a regulation and to conclude by saying this time for the representatives of this state, of the member state, the commission to show courage and ambition to adopt instruments to get guarantee their useful effect. Minimalist solution dictated by misinterpretation of the concept of national identity. Because when you talk about uh, criminal law, immediately other oh, national identity, say de la foutaise, on dirait en français, n'est-ce pas? Lead to a waste of time and energy and dispense effectively for community action. So this is your message which you should launch in the past, in the future, and not talk about what was before, was this now future, vision. We need the vision for younger people like you, full of enthusiasm. And the legal base, you find them. You said 83, 86, 3, 3, 2, 5. There are a lot of legal bases if there is a political policy. So Will. this is message when you, when you come in seminar, uh, talking about uh, general aspects and not the specific aspects of mediation, which is necessarily technical, can give so much. But someone like you speaks about general uh, uh, environment. Please, 
next time, since I, I, I know you, give vision, give ambition, okay? Thank you. Uh, any further question? Yes, uh, the microphone, please. Uh, if you want that people see you from, you, you should come this way. That's no, okay. it's okay like this. Thank so, you. Um, so, uh, just, it's just a short comment, basically. It's not a question to the presentation by our Portuguese colleague. I just wanted to share some Croatian experience, which is quite different with regard to the European public prosecutor. Because in Croatia, uh, as far as I understood your presentation, it's a question of independence of your national European uh, prosecutor from the national politics. Well, in Croatia, the situation is quite different. Uh, we have one, a very prominent case, which is currently dealt by the European public prosecutor. And it's been a case uh, of a misappropriation of European funds by a former member of the government. And this case was uh, by an alleged misappropriation of funds. And this case was discovered by the media and it was brought to the attention of national prosecuting authorities. And it has been investigated for a couple of months, but it didn't result in anything. And and thereupon, after that, the case was also investigated by the European Public Prosecutor's Office after the office was established. And a couple of months uh, after the initiation, after the investigation was started, uh, the, the public was informed uh, that there is a suspicion that there has been a misappropri misappropriation of funds by the former minister. So this was established by the European public prosecutor. And in Croatia, this was well, very much welcomed by the public as a sign that, okay, this might be finally like a prosecution service which is going to be independent of national politics and which might bring an added value in a situation where uh, politically influential people are investigated by national authorities. So in this case, this is like a supranational authority. And therefore, the public so far recognizes this as an important added value to the investigation of these kinds of cases. So just a short comment. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Buric for this uh, remark, or I don't know if you want to reply. Uh, because it will be very short. Uh, we could learn something about the Croatian example, but it's precisely that. Uh, the Portuguese public also wanted uh, this to be a new type of public prosecutor, which could be independent, which could pursue some um, criminal matters in which a national public prosecutor is not effective. But due to this case, um, the goodwill uh, is not um, as large as, as it was initially. So it can work and it's a good idea, but uh, maybe we should introduce some check and, checks and balances to the power of the council in the regulation itself. I just want to say, th this institution created a lot of optimism in, in Croatia. You know, people suddenly, in the media, people started talking, we are going to inform the European public prosecutor about this. And, you know, and in Croatia, it is generally perceived that Croatian po politicians are now going to be more careful about these kinds of things because, and not only politicians, but everybody, about these kinds of things because there is somebody who really takes care of the European money. Like that's the current, we don't have, this is, uh, we don't have a finished case. We don't know what's going to happen in this case also. It's, uh, it hasn't developed really in the last couple of months. I don't know, there has been no information about what's going on at this moment in the case, only that an investigation is open. So, it's very, it's impossible to give uh, any definite result, only a very 
optimistic expectation in the Croatian public is created about this institution. Ale, posso replicare? Yes. Uh, Perché sono, sono stato, I was uh, involved in my first, uh, by Please. Professor. Yeah. Oh, no, just to, say, just to say, okay, sorry, sorry to intervene, but I, uh, I want to say a few words on your comments, which I, I, I agree, I didn't have enough time. My, my aim was that, in my speech, was that of showing a little bit, uh, uh, giving a little bit uh, a uh, historical uh, overview of what happened in the European communities and then in the European Union, the development uh, and how we have uh, come to the current uh, framework, legislative framework. But let me say in few words what I think, frankly. Be first of all, I'm not that young <laughs> as it might seem because, uh, because my hair is still brown, but, <laughs> but I, I'm 60, I I'm, I'm, was born in uh, 1967, so I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> so, but le let me say just what one uh, message. Uh, we could say that uh, in the, for the sake of European integration, uh, we, we, we might conclude that it has been done much more in the past than today. It's a paradox because we have uh, the Treaty of Lisbon that under many, many aspects uh, has uh, developed very much European integration also and maybe mainly in the field of a cooperation, judicial cooperation, uh, both on civil and also on criminal law. But as for the general, the general uh, principles of European integration, uh, what has been done in the 70s and in the 80s by the Court of Justice has not been done later by the political institutions. And this, is, must, this must be uh, specific, particularly clear today for those who approach to the studies of European Union law. Because in the end, the Court of Justice has been very brave in the past, integrating the treaties with the general principles that weren't present in the treaties. And now we should... Uh, take advantage of this uh, case law of the European Court of Justice. But on the contrary, while we have on the one hand other uh, provisions in the treaties that would allow the member states to go further in the, in the policies, at the same time, there are many governments who uh, challenge the integration process in those same fields. So that's why I still see the previous uh, case law of the Court of Justice particularly, particularly inspiring for the future steps that should be taken and uh, the steps that should be taken for us and for the European institutions because what has been done in the past was much more developed, I would say, than the, the, what is uh, done today, uh, notwithstanding uh, the progress made under the Lisbon treaties. This is a paradox, but it is what I think and what I see by comparing the previous case law of the Court of Justice and the current situation uh, according to the institutional framework also that I tried to describe in my speech. Sorry for that. Thank you, Alfredo, for your remarks. Indeed, I think that the students who are here in this uh, uh, conference room today uh, have taken note of what you said because they were not there when the institutions and the Court of Justice uh, did what you said they did. So thank you for having reminded us that um, the, uh, the, the whole framework of the European Union construction. Okay, uh, I'm sorry for, uh, uh, 
one last thing I forgot to say before that uh, within the Spanish team, there is also Carmen Guil. Uh, Dr. Carmen Guil is a judge in the district court of Barcelona. She also was supposed to, to speak today, but unfortunately for us, she had a very big hearing uh, and so she could not attend, but she has contributed to the written national report of, uh, the Span on the Spanish legislation. And as I said, I'm sorry for you that are at home. I hope you will continue to stay with us also after the coffee break with very nice, um, little things uh, prepared here. Uh, and uh, thank you once again for being connected to this virtual conference room. And uh, we uh, have the coffee break now and we resume the session, let's say in 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, we are resuming the session, starting with the perspective of uh, Greece, Cyprus, and Bulgaria. Um, I have just for the beginning an announcement to make, especially for the online attendants. Uh, quindi in particolare uh, per uh, i nostri uh, utenti online, per il nostro auditorio online, uh, perché alle 12.30 vi verrà proposto uh, un acquisito a risposta multipla, insomma con due risposte, uh, occorrente per attestare la presenza e il riconoscimento dei crediti. Avrete tempo fino alle ore 13, quindi avrete 30 minuti di tempo fino dalle 12.30 fino all'interruzione di questa sessione eh, per cliccare sulle due risposte che vi eh, sembrano eh, più corrette tra quelle proposte. Um, thank you very much. Um, I will immediately introduce you uh, Professor Ioannis Naziris. Uh, who is Associate Professor in Criminal and Criminal Procedure Law at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in uh, Greece, uh, and who is uh, proposing us a perspective upon um, Greeks, Greek and Cypriot uh, legislation um, of the ADR mechanism and his intervention will focus especially on the expediency uh, and the rule of law of the ADR mechanism in these two uh, legislative systems. You have the floor, Professor Naziris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, word was made earlier about exaggerating on national particularities or idiosyncrasies. And I think that the comparison between Greece and Cyprus will be quite enlightening in this regard, because sometimes in the European Union, we tend to think that we are so different, but it seems as though two nations that are very close to each other, like Greece and Cyprus, have entirely different systems. And this shows that we tend to exaggerate cultural differences or similarities a little bit. So it's more a question about what justice we want in the European Union and not where we come from rather where we want to go. This is an introductory comment, and I will begin with discussing a little bit generally the concept of ADR in the context of the rule of law, which is, of course, not something that people think about when they talk about ADR. Traditional rule of law principles, generally speaking, have cer certain core attributes, like the generality of the rules, equal application, and legal certainty. That's what we're used to in talking about justice in general. And from these general rules spring the, their immediate corollaries like individual rights and serving human dignity. And then newer developments would also include social welfare, but this does not relate to criminal law, so I will not discuss this really. So we have fair rules, mostly from substantive criminal law, general in nature, a priori, so that the state cannot infringe on your fundamental rights and equally applicable. 
Then we have a process to apply these rules, which is presumably a truth-seeking process. We look for the substantive truth. We have strictly formulated steps in the criminal process system, and the system is aimed towards imposing punishment. If guilt is established, we want to serve the traditional purposes of a pena, of the penalty. And then we have rights to restrict the state's prerogatives. And rights are aimed at equalizing the status of the defendant vis-a-vis -vis the state, which is much stronger. But the rights that we have in the criminal justice system largely consist in effect in giving means to the defendant to delay the finding of truth or to deviate from the truth entirely. That's what we have. It's, it's not a wrong system, but we have to describe what we actually have. And in the European Union, if you want to assimilate rights, then you go to the least common denominator and then everybody wants to deviate from the truth and avoid getting there sooner rather than later. And to a lesser degree, we have ensured the victim's participation in the proceedings. In countries like my country, Greece, for example, legal scholarship tends to focus 99% on the rights of the defendant. If you talk about the rights of the victim, you're considered a conservative in terms of criminal law. And I believe we should change that because the rights of the victim should equally be protected under the rule of law. Now, restorative justice is an entirely different question. Yesterday, we were talking uh, with a Croatian colleague about the peculiar rights of the criminal justice system, like the right to remain silent. But in restorative justice terms, the assumption of responsibility requires the defendant to actually talk, coupled with an explanation. Talk as opposed to remain silent. Why would you want the defendant to remain silent? You want him to explain what he did. And then you go to conciliation with the victim. So it's not the state versus the defendant. It's the victim and the defendant together trying to find a solution. Then you go to restitution, mending as a making as opposed to breaking. So not punishing, but repairing the damage and then punishing maybe for dissuasive purposes, but not as uh, the only purpose that you have. And of course, rehabilitation of the defendant, ideally with the participation of the community. So reintegration as opposed to isolation, which comes with punishment. One final general comment. The expansion of restorative justice in Greece over the last 10 years was essentially due to the financial crisis. We had to speed things up because it cost too much money and time. So expediency was the driving force behind our restorative justice mechanisms and ADR in general, of which we have a lot, as you will see now. But the expansion of restorative justice does not mean speeding up necessarily. Yesterday, the representative from, from Slovakia said that ADR actually costs time and documentation to fulfill. And we have seen that in Greece as well. So the prosecutor has to work differently, perhaps, but sometimes more, as opposed to bringing a case to court. So in essence, restorative justice should be pursued for its own sake, not to save time, but rather because we believe in this form of justice. And if we believe in this form of justice, it may be worth taking more steps to ensure that it is properly administered. As time goes by, you might save time in the end, but we have not seen that in Greece so far. So not, not for the last 10 years, although the idea was to expedite. So you have certain institutions that serve restorative purposes. This is on the left. You have certain institutions that ser serve decongestion purposes, but not necessarily restoration of the damage. And then you have the middle ground where restoration meets decongestion, but that's only part of, uh, of the story. Let me tell you a few things about Greece and Cyprus, which I will compare uh, as states. Now, they culturally, like I said, we are very close to each other, although Cyprus has a considerable uh, Turkish uh, uh, community. Uh, and of course, there is a, an eternal issue that has to be resolved at some point. But generally speaking, the two countries are very close to each other. We were under Ottoman rule for four and three centuries, respectively. But Cyprus became a British colony right after that for about 80 years. So this is why then we diverged from each other. Greece has been an EU member state since 1981. It was the 10th EU member state. And it immediately gave, of course, the Greek Mace case as the first very important uh, EU fraud case in the European Union. That was our early contribution uh, to the Union, to the communities. Cyprus has been an EU member state since 2004. Greece and Cyprus are both in the Eurozone. U Greece, since its conception, not the best and brightest of members of the Eurozone, as you might have heard, but since its conception anyway. And Cyprus 
ever since 2008. Before Cyprus entered the Eurozone, its pound was stronger than the Euro, and its economy was growing at a much uh, healthier pace than most of the Eurozone member states. So it had a vibrant economy. The population of Greece is about 10 times that of Cyprus. In terms of our legal systems, Greece is a continental legal system and our criminal law comes essentially from Germany uh, ever since the 19th century when Greece became independent. Cyprus is a common law system with continental law influences, so entirely different system because of the British colonial rule up until 1960. Greece subscribes to mandatory prosecution with certain exceptions, especially over the last 10 years, essentially in terms of financial crime where we have prosecutorial discretion now. And this was actually part of the package deal to save the Greek economy. In fact, many of these institutions were imposed on Greece by outside uh, influence, by, by our European allies, because they said we have to speed up the criminal justice system. Cyprus subscribes to prosecutorial discretion, and uh, it has an impressive array of powers for the Attorney General of the Republic. Greece does not recognize criminal liability of legal persons. It runs against the very core of our beliefs about what criminal law is. Cyprus has criminal liability of legal persons subscribing to uh, British influences. And uh, in Greece, the major problem is massive delays uh, bordering on denial of justice, actually exceeding denial of justice, if you ask me. It takes many years for a case to come to court. Whereas in Cyprus, things tend to be a little faster but the system is a, a very conservative. They tend to favor harsh punishment so that you get very severe penalties under uh, the, the Cypriot system, at least for certain offenses. We had similar problems leading us to adopt ADR measures. In Greece, the fiscal crisis led to a sovereign debt crisis. So the state was in debt. And this was due in large part to financial offenses against the state budget and a lot of corruption. We also have a significant array of cases of EU fraud. And this also has to do with the notion of many people that stealing money from the European Union does not count as stealing money, really. And, but that, to some extent, is also true about offenses against the Greek budget. And then we had bailout programs, which imposed strict conditions on the economy. Cyprus had a very serious financial crisis because of a bloated banking sector. And the offenses they had essentially were related to money laundering because they attract foreign capital and Cyprus has become an offshore financial center over the last decade. So it's an entirely different story. And they had a bailout program, a much smaller one, of course, which resulted in a bail-in and people lost their deposits. Everyone that had over 100,000 euros, for example, lost their money. So an entirely different uh, bailout and bail-in system, but they have managed to recuperate much more efficiently uh, and fast compared to Greece. And they now have uh, their economies in a much better shape. And in terms of transposition of the PIF directive, which I will not talk to uh, in detail, prior to 2020, Greece had another statute like Cyprus. Both countries in 2020 uh, transposed the directive. Cyprus chose to essentially translate uh, the PIF directive, which resulted in many problems, like, for example, uh, um, the Croatian representatives yesterday talked about misappropriation and how it is not transposed. Cyprus presumably incorporated misappropriation, but they did not do it in the right way. So in effect, they have not transposed uh, misappropriation. Greece, however, has enacted a very different system, which is interesting and that you will uh, hear about later on, uh, which I think is much better than what we had before 2020. That relates to substantive criminal law. And in terms of our relation with the EPO, uh, the European Public Prosecutor's Office. The EPO has received 39 reports related to Greece compared to only five uh, from Cyprus. The active investigations are now 17 related to Greece with a total estimated damage of 43 million euros and only three active investigations in relation to Cyprus with the estimated damage not exceeding 1.5 million euros. This is until December, 2021. And in fact, many people thought that the EPO would have a lot of work related to Cyprus. There was even an interview stating that about 10% of the cases would relate to Cyprus, but this has proven wrong. And in fact, the Attorney General in Cyprus has recently issued a statement saying, we were right, EU fraud is not an issue in Cyprus. 
there are other issues in Cyprus, but not, EU fraud is not a major one. In Greece, however, it forms a considerable part of our caseload. And when we talk about the principle of legality or mandatory prosecution versus opportunity or prosecutorial discretion, these two do not oppose each other. So we will see that Greece has adopted a peculiar system of legality, but with some prosecutorial means to stop the prosecution, but these are very strictly regulated. There are very specific terms by which the prosecutor can terminate the prosecution or not initiate in the first place. Whereas in Cyprus, they're much more flexible because the prosecution can essentially do whatever they want with a the case. They can stop it without any questions asked. So I will not tire you with all these details. Uh, I have included these in the Greek report, but Greece now has a lot of institutions ensuring the non-initiation or the termination of a prosecution if essentially money is paid. And I'm only focusing on financial offenses because we also have mediation in terms of domestic violence cases, in terms of juvenile law, the same goes for Cyprus. So we have very many institutions right now. We, we didn't used to have any of these about 10 years ago, but because of the financial crisis, now we have a lot of them. You get them in substantive criminal law, you get them in criminal procedure, you get them before the prosecution, you get them after the prosecution, you, you get them if there is an agreement with the victim or regardless of an agreement with the victim, you get them if you pay the capital or capital plus interest, or if you pay less than that. And they sometimes lead to acquittal or termination of the proceedings. Sometimes you get a mitigated punishment. So you get all sorts of institutions right now in Greece, and these overlap and sometimes in funny ways. So in essence, the Greek system is like waiting uh, for a train, and there are a lot of trains coming your way going to different destinations. And sometimes in Greece, it's better to wait for the next train because the next train will get you to acquittal. And if you took the former train, you would get a mitigated punishment because there is lack of coordination right now. If you try to coordinate everything, you create funny situations. And in Cyprus, they do not have a comprehensive set of ADR mechanisms, but they have given the general power to the attorney general to decide to terminate proceedings. So if you make a deal with the attorney general, the prosecution may be terminated and no punishment will be meted out. This is more flexible, but Greeks fear that this will give too much authority to the prosecution. And one thing we don't trust is institutions in Greece and essentially judicial mechanisms. The people do not trust the prosecutor to do the job properly. And if you don't trust the prosecutor, you wouldn't hand them over this power to stop any prosecution because people would say, you stop this prosecution, but not that prosecution. So you were bribed and so forth. So you see entirely different conceptions of justice, of authority, and Cyprus, because it was a colonially ruled state by Great Britain, I wouldn't say that the people have trust in institutions, but I would say that they tolerate the power of the institutions more easily compared to Greece. So the Attorney General has extensive powers there. But this is the result in Greece, however, you micromanage every possible institution with particular provisions, which are huge. You get an article that is three or four pages long, and the prosecutors simply do not want to apply these provisions because they are too complicated in actual practice. You could, I have classified these institutions in Greece based on whether they belong to procedural or substantive criminal law, and based on whether they lead to no sentence imposed or a mitigated sentence. But there are also finer distinctions. How soon the prosecution is terminated, and if it's mitigated punishment, how mitigated the punishment is. So you get all those uh, institutions all over the place. And frankly, I don't know of a single prosecutor who has used even one third of these institutions. So basically, this leads to canceling out the very concept of, of uh, this institution. In Cyprus, there is no ADR culture, I would say, uh, essentially. First of all, because societal predis predispositions play a part. Uh, for example, the Cypriot society is very dynamic and financially vibrant, as I have said, but at the same time, they're very conservative. So a, a whole host of offenses would not be part of bargaining processes. They wouldn't discuss that. Secondly, they favor litigation 
as opposed to mediation. The whole system, the lawyers push towards litigation on the island. So unless this is a major case and the general attorney intervenes, lawyers will want to bring it to court as opposed to counseling and closing it. And we also see that in civil law cases, not just criminal law cases. And thirdly, Cyprus used to be a British colony until 1960. So they, they're a common law system, but they got their law from British law as it existed until the 50s, essentially. So more modern institutions that we see in the United Kingdom have not found their way to Cyprus because after 1960, they have regulated their own affairs. So they have locked themselves to the situation that existed in 1960. So a lot of their rules are archaic. And the only thing to mitigate that is the general power of the attorney general, essentially. But they have old English law, so to speak. And they still follow judgments that you saw in the House of Lords decades ago that even UK courts do not refer to anymore. So this is also very interesting. Also in Cyprus, restorative justice is not really a big thing. Even if you return the full amount of money, even if you restore the damage in full plus interest, you're not guaranteed acquittal. I mean, the attorney general could terminate the proceedings, but you're not guaranteed acquittal. Even in the case of an attempt, if you stop the attempt willfully and the attempt is not completed, there is an explicit provision in the Cypriot Criminal Code set saying that you will be punished anyway and to begin with, with the same penalty as a completed offense. And the court may mitigate that depending on how soon you stop the attempt. So this is very peculiar for us. Because if you seize an attempt under Greek law, for instance, you get no punishment if it's early enough, like most continental law systems. And we have what the Germans would call after the, the fact. So if you return the money, you also get an acquittal, usually, if it's full restoration of the damage. But not in Cyprus. In Cyprus, they don't have that. Again, you would have to count on the attorney general to terminate the proceedings or on the court to mitigate the sentence on a case-by-case -case basis, not on, based on general rules. So the central feature in Cyprus is the power of the Attorney General, and there is a rather impressive article in the Constitution itself. Article 113, Section 2 says that the Attorney General of the Republic retains complete authority, unchecked authority, to, upon his own discretion, I'm using the term his discretion because attorney generals tend to be male in Cyprus. Initiate, manage, continue, or terminate any process against any person within the Republic concerning any offense, no questions asked, prior to the issuing of a decision by the court. So the attorney general may simply say that the Republic is no longer interested in bringing punishment to that individual for any offense. The attorney general will not usually exercise that power, but there is the prerogative to do so, which is very interesting. And the office of the attorney general also dates back to British colonial rule, back to 1878. And they have retained this, the structure of a fully enabled attorney general like Great Britain had for many of its colonies uh, about a century ago. And Article 154 of the Cypriot Code of Criminal Procedure vests the attorney general with the general prerogative to suspend any criminal process at his own discretion. So the attorney general may say, stop this prosecution on its tracks. We don't want this to proceed. If the attorney general makes use of this article, suspension does not produce res judicata, which means that the prosecution may be reopened in the future upon the attorney general's own discretion again. So the attorney general may actually block a court from uh, even prior to the sentencing stage. If a decision is issued, however, it may only be appealed. It is no longer in the hands of the attorney general, but up to the time when guilt is found and the sentence is imposed, the attorney general may simply withdraw the case from the docket and say, we don't want this to proceed anymore. And sometimes it will be done in uh, covert terms. Okay, let me speed up. Just a few words about plea bargaining. We didn't have plea bargaining in Greece. We had, they have plea bargaining in Cyprus informally. Again, it's up to the attorney general. And sometimes the, the prosecution will inflate the charges and then negotiate to remove some of them in order to convict you of the rest. So they will never use plea bargaining to fully leave you off the hook. They will simply reduce the charges which they have artificially inflated to begin with. In Greece, 
Plea bargaining has not yet been applied in actual practice because people do not really believe in plea bargaining and our prosecutors have not been trained to engage in plea bargaining. And I do not believe in plea bargaining either, but we have it. We have it for everything except for offenses incurring life sentence, sexual offenses, and uh, a couple of other offenses. But we now have plea bargaining for financial offenses, including offenses affecting the financial interests of the European Union. So we, you can have that. And the victim is not asked about whether they want plea bargaining to become fruitful. So the victim is out of the loop as regards this uh, issue. Uh, like I said, th this is the Greek system right now. All the exits from the criminal process in terms of financial offenses alone. If you exit on the green level, you get acquitted. If you exit on the purple level, you get a mitigated punishment. But sometimes if you exit on the red level, which is subsequent, you get an acquittal. So you'd bet if you miss the green train, you'd better wait for the red train sometimes. You would have to pay more money because interest accrues in time, but you would ensure an acquittal. So many people wait. And the other thing that Greece has done is privatize criminal justice to some, to some extent. So for instance, fraud right now is only prosecutable if the victim presses charges. And I'm not simply talking about minor or petty fraud. I'm talking about fraud, even if it is a felony. So if I defraud a private company to the amount of 10 million euros, the, the company has to press charges so that I am brought to justice. This does not apply to the European Union, however. Every offense against the European Union, starting from the first euro, is prosecutable proprio motu. So the European Union is a different case. But uh, in uh, Greek entities, they would have to press charges. And this does not apply to all offenses. So if I break the glass of a window of a private company, that's prosecutable proprio motu, even if it costs 200 euros. But if I defraud them to the amount of 10 million euros, they have to bring charges. This is, again, some of the funny things that we have seen because of the financial crisis to, to help restore huge damages against companies. Uh, let me, because in the interest of time, just one or two comments. Because we have so many complicated rules in Greece, you need to, uh, to have certain axioms or meta rules. Uh, like for example, if it's earlier, you prefer it. If it's substantive law, you prefer it as opposed to procedural law. If it's acquitting you, you prefer it as opposed to mitigating punishment. And if you place them all together, you have a set of meta rules to regulate all these in ADR institutions now, which is extremely complicated. But Cyprus on the right is much simpler. The attorney general has general power to stop any prosecution. They have the opportunity principle, unfettered powers. So the resolution will take place on a case by case basis. And I would call that political realism versus rule of law. What Greece has tried to do is imitate the rule of law in terms of its ADR processes. So despite the fact that ADR does not originate in rule of law principles, it's something different. We have created ADR very strictly regulated with general rules that are supposed to be applied equally. So we have imitated rule of law principles in our ADR institutions. So now we have an exhaustive list of mechanisms. They overlap. Sometimes they contradict each other. And that is not very practicable at the end of the day. So my, we have certain problems with the EPO that we may discuss uh, if someone is interested later. But in order to conclude, I believe the ultimate question is, what kind of justice you want? If you want to forward punishment in the traditional sense, you will be dissuasive but the con would be that we have a lengthy process and very costly. If you want to restore damages, on the other hand, that's a different question. You may go to notions of justice that are more pertinent to ADR. But ADR, as we have seen, has many forms. You can imitate the rule of law as in Greece, or in fact, you get lengthy processes again and you miss the point. Or you can have a more flexible system, but a more flexible system requires enhanced authority to the prosecution. And the European Union has to decide which way to go. Do you want to, to, uh, to have dissuasive punishment to convince people that they should not defraud the European Union? Or do you want to restore damage and stop lengthy proceedings? And if you want restorative justice and ADR, 
what kind of ADR do you want? Cultural differences are indeed exaggerated, however. I would tend to agree with that. It's about what we want to impose. Cyprus and Greece, very similar populations, but very different legal systems. Whether it works or not has to do with the structure of the system itself, not with where we come from, but where we in fact want to go. Thank you for your attention. And I apologize for seeing you. Thank you very much, Professor Naziris. Uh, this comparative approach is extremely uh, interesting because we are discovering that um, we are not simply dealing uh, uh, in a choice between, um, uh, between expediency and uh, a dissuasive uh, procedure. Uh, between uh, mandatory or opportunity principle. Uh, all the systems have uh, hinders and we have to check and balance uh, the effectiveness of the results everywhere. Um, we are continuing with a comparative approach uh, with Professor Athena Janakula, who is a PhD of EU criminal law at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and he's member of the teaching board of the National School of Judges in Greece, uh, who proposes us uh, a comparative uh, vision uh, of the Greek system with the Bulgarian system, uh, in particular on the legislation on the criminal offenses against the, against the union's financial interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the entire drum uh, team for your uh, hospitality and assistance uh, in fixing problems. Uh, can I have... Uh, uh, so following the, uh, this uh, complete uh, presentation, uh, concise and complete presentation of the ADR mechanisms concerning Greece, uh, along with Cyprus, but uh, I, I'm interested in the Greek part of that presentation by Professor Naziris. Uh, I would like to focus on an issue that um, uh, Professor Naziris referred to uh, briefly, um, and and this is the uh, the way that the Greek legislator has chosen to transpose the PIF directive in the Greek uh, legal order and. Uh, I have made this choice because this is a very interesting, I think, example of transposition. At least it is for Greek standards. It's a rather original method that was used. And it is not just its originality, but it is the fact that it serves specific, it, is, it aims to serve specific, uh, it, it has behind it specific reasons and aims to serve specific purposes. So it is uh, the introduction of a system actually, and not just uh, a random transposition of uh, EU legislation, which would not have been unusual for uh, Greek uh, for the Greek case. So uh, I would like to present this uh, system to you and perhaps uh, discuss the just the basic traits and its logic, so that we can maybe see uh, would it be a model system for the future. And uh, in this uh, context, I will also add some elements of the Bulgarian legislation concerning uh, the protection of the financial interests of the EU, and uh, very briefly on the ADR procedures. Um, I am not, uh, I, I cannot speak uh, Bulgarian, but I had the chance to study uh, the criminal code and their uh, code of criminal procedure uh, in length because they are translated in English in their latest version. So I thought it would be interesting to have a perspective from Bulgaria as well. So uh, starting with the transposition of the BIF, di of the BIF directive in Greece, uh, there were two main challenges to address, two basic challenges. Uh, the first one is that the legislation that already existed, uh, that had incorporated the obligations under the BIF convention was problematic and it was ineffective. Uh, it was problematic in terms of the assimilation principle, the, um, the um, 
uh, offenses against the European Union had a more uh, lenient, um, uh, we were dealing them in a more lenient way, and uh, the courts um, uh, gradually uh, restricted the application of this law. So we could not use the existing uh, reg the existing rules transposing the former PIF convention. So how about the existing common rules? How about the rules on the common rules on fraud, on embezzlement, etc.? Well, there was also a problem there because uh, the PIF directive has notions that are broader in scope than the Greek uh, legislation. So uh, the notion of property is uh, broader under the PIF directive compared to the, the Greek concept of property, according to our criminal code. And uh, there are also differences in substance in how we perceive, for example, um, uh, fraud. Um, we, uh, I give you an example here. We need more elements uh, in the fraud offense than the ones um, that exist in the PIF, in the respective PIF provision. So it was not easy to just um, say that we will apply the provisions that we already have in our criminal code. So um, there was a need for a change, obviously, uh, and the legislator contemplated three possible options. One was to adopt uh, a single separate self-standing legislative act that would contain all the uh, offenses, the financial offenses against the um, European Union. Uh, but this was the way that we had gone the first time with the PIF convention and that was that had proved problematic. We had a problem in treating uh, the EU property uh, uh, offenses and the Greek pro state property offenses in the same way and some problem practical problems as well. So um, there were problems with option number one. Uh, option number two would be to transpose the PIF directive within our criminal code and amend the corresponding provisions. For example, the provision on fraud. Uh, this was also, this was not um, an option that the legislator wanted to go to because that would mean that uh, the uh, definitions of the offenses would uh, have a broader scope, and it, our criminal code has been uh, has been set in force in 2019. We have a new criminal code which has been redrafted or at least uh, in its entirety re-examined. So there are complete concrete choices there by the legislator, recent choices, and um, there was no. It was a question whether we wanted to uh, change all that. And the third option was um, uh, a complex one, a rather composite one, but which might appear to be a, a more effective one. So this, according to this, we would introduce a system that would consist of, of three types of provisions. First of all, existing provisions of the criminal code, like the provision on fraud, but we would apply this only in those cases where it would be possible. Um, for this provision to apply, we would need to assimilate the protection of the EU property to the protection of Greek state property, so as to have the same level of, uh, and to be able to uh, apply the same provisions. So existing rules would apply to PIF offenses whenever a relevant act of violation or uh, an offense would fall within the their scope of application and if this existing provision was appropriate. This will become more apparent uh, with the following um, types. Uh, the second type, so existing provisions, then the following uh, types would be provisions supplementing those existing provisions of the criminal code, meaning that if you have the fraud um, uh, definition, the fraud offense, and it has a, a rather strict, let's say, scope of application under the Greek criminal code, then you would create 
another offense that would be broader uh, and resemble the, PIF, the definition of the PIF directive. And this would apply in those cases where the act cannot fall within directly within uh, the fraud, uh, the scope of application of the fraud offense under the Greek criminal code. So in that case, we would use a supplementary uh, broader definition of the offense. And uh, these supplementary definitions, as you understand, would only apply in cases of uh, affecting the EU financial interest. So in this case, we would give more protection, of course, to the EU financial interests, uh, according to the PIF directive. And the third type of offenses would be that we would introduce some new uh, separate standalone offenses whenever this is necessary. So if uh, we need uh, the definition of an offense, but it is not at all appropriate under the Greek law, then uh, we would make a new one, but only when this is necessary. So uh, if you remember the, the options, what we had when we incorporated the PIF convention and the first option here would be to make separate rules. Under this system, we use this only as a third option and only when it is necessary because what we already have is not appropriate. So this does seem, uh, I think, uh, rather complex, but we'll see how it works and whether uh, it's effective in the end. So uh, starting with uh, the uh, offenses under the PIF convention, um, uh, the first one uh, uh, relating to uh, non-procurement related expenditure. Well, in this case, we have uh, Article 24, Paragraph 1 of Statute Number uh, of, the of, the, of the law that incorporated the PIF directive. And there you have a definition that is similar uh, to Article 3, Paragraph 2.A of the, of, the, of the PIF Convention. But you also have the clause that this applies only when the act in question cannot be punished in a harsher way under common provisions. And which are these common provisions? The, commission, the provisions on fraud, computer fraud, and fraud concerning subsidies. So if you have an act that can be uh, punished under the Greek uh, uh, provision on fraud, then you will punish it like this, even if uh, it affects uh, EU financial interest. But if you cannot apply the Greek provision on fraud, then you will consider, you will try to apply Article 24, Paragraph 1, which supplements the scope of application of the Greek provision on fraud. So uh, in this case, we use, uh, you see from uh, the system uh, uh, types, a, uh, the first type and the second type of the offenses. The same goes with the following uh, type of fraud, which is procurement related expenditure. It's exactly the same structure. And we have the same structure also for misappropriation, which under the PIF directive, uh, it is an offense related to um, EU fraud. So you also have the same structure here. Uh, if you can punish it under the Greek provision on embezzlement or the Greek provision on breach of trust, then you will use those. And if not, you will use the supplementary one of uh, Article 24, Paragraph 4. Things get a, get a bit more uh, complex uh, in those cases where, um, where for example, uh, when it comes to revenue other than the revenue arising from VAT. In this case, you have exactly the same thing uh, you will apply the fraud provisions, and if you cannot, then you will apply Article 24, Paragraph 3. But when it comes to revenue from customs, we already have some very broad provisions for that. So you, you don't need any supplements for this. You don't need auxiliary offenses. You will apply uh, the articles uh, of the National Code of uh, Customs and Duties. So. Uh, when it comes to revenue from customs, things are even uh, simpler. Uh, then we have uh, the third type of offenses when it comes to revenue arising from VAT uh, for, on resources. Why? Because we considered that the respective Greek provision was not appropriate. 
So there was a need for a new provision. So now you have seen examples of all types uh, of offenses where you use the common ones with their supplements or only the common ones or uh, completely new ones. Um, I will not get into more detail about this, uh, just a few, note, uh, a few notes about the rest. Uh, money laundering is now regulated in the law for money laundering, along with all the other uh, offenses falling within the predicate offenses of, uh, concerning money laundering. Uh, corruption also has uh, common provisions that can apply, uh, but uh, there was a need for um, a, a provision that would allow these provisions to apply when it comes to all EU officials. And uh, well, I have concluded all the cases and now you can see in this table um, all the types of uh, the criminal offenses that we have created and all the types of offenses that are used to transpose the BIF directive. So as you can see in column one, we can use our own national legislation in most cases. Uh, also, in many cases, uh, we have auxiliary offenses, supplementary definitions for criminal offenses that are broader under the BIF directive, so that we cover everything that the BIF directive uh, uh, requires. And then we have uh, a new and entirely new criminal offense when it comes to revenue uh, arising from uh, VAT on resources. So this is how the system is structured, uh, which is a bit uh, perhaps um, complex to, to uh, comprehend at first, but once you have it, uh, it has very clear, um, it has a very clear content and structure. Uh, also, just to mention, in order for this to be complete, you can see at the bottom that I also mentioned there are provisions applying uh, the principle of assimilation. These apply to aggravated offenses, saying that when we have very heavy um, uh, penalties for in very serious violations against the uh, Greek state property, these also apply to uh, European Union um, property. So uh, these provisions are very important, although they uh, refer to the aggravated offenses. And of course, one would have to add the provision on organized crime if we wanted to see the material scope of the EPPO due to Article 22 of the regulation on the EPPO. So what the legislator tried to do is uh, try to make use of the existing legal framework so as to avoid problems of the past. Um, to respect the principle of proportionality and to avoid disrupting the consistency of the Greek legal system um, and also to deal with practical problems, for example, when it came to uh, concurrence uh, bit of offenses of, for example, an act affecting both at the same time, both uh, Greek state and EU financial interests. So far, th there is criticism in the sense that um, one might think that we should go for a special uh, criminal law uh, dealing with uh, these offenses and making a, a very clear uh, uh, framework uh, just by its adoption. And also that there are some problems in the definitions of the offenses, but these uh, originate, in the criticism also concerns the fifth directive, not just the Greek transposing law. Just a few words uh, about the Bulgarian system now in perspective. Um, well, first of all, in Bulgaria, um, if, if we see that the criminal law, the criminal code has many references to EU funds, to uh, affecting EU funds. So you have explicit references like that. Also, what is a characteristic is that many uh, criminal offenses that for me, for example, coming from, uh, the, from Greece, uh, which we place in special laws are placed within their criminal code, like money laundering or uh, smuggling. So their criminal code is uh, a very, is um, of course a very, a very important legislation, but uh, it, it comprises many um, criminal offenses, even more than what one might find, uh, might wait to find there. 
and also their notifications of from Bulgaria to the European Union did not include any special criminal law. So it was it is valid to assume that we can find the offenses that we're looking for within their criminal code. And if you see, they are going, um, they have some special provisions, but other than that, uh, they don't seem to have amended their national legislation in order to be able to apply it to uh, PIF offenses. They, uh, they have these just uh, added the EU funds in some cases, but other than that, the definitions of the offenses of the acts do not seem to have been uh, affected at least yet. So one might wonder whether this is uh, effective and complete as in transposition. Uh, very briefly, um, the most important ADR mechanism in Bulgaria is disposing a case by virtue of an agreement between the public prosecutor and the counsel, the, the, uh, the lawyer of uh, the defendant. Um, this does apply to financial offenses uh, falling within the material scope of the EPPO. I think that what is interesting here is that the result is that uh, the, um, the defendant can have um, a reduced penalty. Uh, so I, I did not find any um, mechanisms within the, criminal, the uh, Code of Criminal Procedure of Bulgaria that lead to dropping the procedure, the, uh, to terminating the prosecution. Uh, everything is about expeditiency and um, about uh, um, reducing the time it takes to either investigate or to uh, have uh, before court. So, uh, so this is why this is the most important um, ADR mechanism and it does apply to uh, financial, uh, yes. So moving on just to my conclusions. Um, um, the Greek system on transposing the uh, PIF directive is, uh, has been considered, I think, um, a very interesting case of transposition and I think it has been, um, uh, we, we all have accepted it in a positive manner. So we are, uh, the less optimistic I think would just have to wait to see whether it works in practice or not. Of course, we all want to see how it will function, uh, but we think that this, is, this was uh, an effort, uh, a positive effort in this respect. Um, the logic behind the system to, try to respect the national characteristics and to uh, not just for the sake of respecting them, but to um, take, let's say, advantage of the effectiveness that they already have in comparison to the effectiveness that the special provisions about EU fraud did not have. Uh, I think that this logic has helped shape the entire system in a way that in the end is rather clear. Um, now, the, the system also helps uh, withhold the uh, consistency of the uh, uh, Greek criminal law in terms of separating and um, creating the chapters of the offenses based on the protected legal interest, instead of taking them out of context and placing them in one legislative act just because they are linked to uh, affecting EU financial interest as well. And this appears to be the choice of the Bulgarian legislator as well. So uh, I think that such uh, as such, the Greek system in the way it was formed, it is a, a model system when it comes to Greek standards, because we have avoided uh, copying, just copying or just randomly uh, transposing the provisions of, PIF, of the BIF directive. And I think that in the end, in terms of its clarity, of its complete conformity, it has, uh, it, it has uh, uh, transposed all the provisions and respect for internal consistency. Uh, well, it makes it an interesting example to contemplate even outside risk uh, more generally. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Janakoulas. Uh, we had, in fact, a very interesting overview of the relevant substantial and procedural uh, provisions of uh, these three countries' legislation. And uh, it seemed to me that there's a long way to come to a common framework on the ADR 
uh, especially on the PIF protection of the financial interest of the European Union protection since national substantial legislation seems to be rather uh, different from one country to another. We are going forward this morning with a view on French legislation. Uh, we have Marta Posito, who is PhD candidate in criminal procedure at the Università di Perugia, who is going to drive us through the Convention Judiciaire d'Intérêt Public, uh, so the competence uh, of uh, EPOS in uh, France, uh, engaging in particular on legal persons' criminal liability. The floor is to you, Marta. Um, I really want to thank you all the DRAMP board for inviting me in this really challenging and stimulating conference that uh, has the capacity to gathering different perspective under one goal, um, enhancing European cooperation in really serious crime such as beef crimes. So I'm here to talk about the French legal system. Oh. Um, I'm here to talk about the French legal system. I really would like to have, uh, first of all, a short summary of the French framework. Um, oh. oh, okay. So. I would like to list key features of French criminal legal system concerning the EPOs and PIF crimes. Then I would like to briefly uh, introduce you to uh, French implementation of um, the legislative framework concerning PIF, PIF directive and other criminal rules and regulation on financial crime. Um, that would be really useful uh, regarding the introduction of the European delegated, delegated prosecutor in France. Um, in, in the last part of my presentation, I would talk about uh, some of the leading alternative dispute resolution tools in French system with a main focus on diversion measure, measure, measures um, concerning mostly uh, legal persons. And I would also like to um, list some of the main and important strategic uh, litigation case law uh, in this field. And this would, this would concern especially the judicial convention of public interest. And then I would like, if, uh, if any, to answer to your questions if there are some remarks on my presentation. So um, I would like to talk about the criminal procedure framework in French uh, legal system and mostly concerning the fact that French uh, legal system is a an inquisitory system, mostly speaking in a general manner, just to give an idea. Um, the French criminal procedure framework uh, concerned three kinds of infringements, uh, contravention, standard offenses, and crimes, contravention, délit, et crime. Concerning the uh, criminal proceeding uh, setting, we have an inquiry phase that, as also um, explained before uh, from other colleagues, is secret, written, and non-contradictory. The public prosecutor and the judicial police are the main chief of this space. And then we have the instruction that is, lead, that is led by the, investigated, the investigating judge. The instruction is, uh, includes also adversary, adversary uh, features. And so it's a, really, um, a little bit more um, not so uh, strict on the uh, investigating um, features. Then we have a second, a third um, important actor in the criminal, French criminal proceeding, and it is the uh, judge of liberties and detention. Uh, this kind of judge is 
uh, jet that control um, uh, measured um, privation of liberty that are asked by a uh, public prosecutor and the investigating ju judge. Concerning the judgment, we have different um, kind of courts and the judgment phase, it's an adversary uh, phase um, based on publicity, principle of publicity, contradictory and orality. We have uh, police court, the, co um, the correctional court, and the SI court. Then, just for having an idea uh, about my, this, this is my draft uh, PowerPoint for um, having a track on my presentation. So, um, I would like to briefly talk about the uh, public prosecutor status because it is a peculiar um, feature of the French legal system. The public prosecutor is a member of the judiciary uh, with judges, and it is um, at the same time a part of the criminal procedure and uh, prosecution and investigation authority that both uh, carry out these two functions. So, um, as in other um, legal system mentioned before, um, French legal system, uh, uh, public prosecutor, um, act uh, uh, following the opportunity principle and the prosecutorial uh, description. And in particular, it could choose uh, um, among three options at the end of the inquiry phase. So it could um, forward the case file to the investigating ju judge for um, um, and that's mean to uh, start the really investigating phase and the indictment. And um, either he could also refer the accused person to another uh, jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction uh, concerning, uh, relating the kind of the offenses. So for example, uh, for um, contravention, a uh, public prosecutor could uh, forward the person to the uh, police court. Otherwise, in the last resort, um, public prosecutor could opt for alternative measure, measures that suspend, therefore, the um, public action exercise. Or uh, at the very um, at the end, he could also dismiss the case. Uh, public prosecutor, uh, public uh, prosecutor in French system, it's in a hierarchical relation with the uh, general prosecutor and the Ministry of Justice. This is a really um, sensitive issue for the French legal system because um, the relation with the executive power led to um, condemnation and remarks from the European Court of Human Rights and also from the Court of uh, Justice, uh, Justice of the European uh, uh, Union. So there uh, were some critical external issues that therefore led the French legislature to reform some parts of the uh, public prosecutor status. And I, by saying this, I'm referring, for instance, to the power, um, the ancient power of the Ministry of Justice to address individual instruction to public prosecutor in individual uh, case file. So since um, the Medvedev uh, um, ruling uh, in 2000 and these and, and 10, uh, there were so uh, reform that um, um, that forbid the Ministry of Justice to um, to address individual instruction to public prosecutor. And nowadays, it is only possible to address general instruction. So um, that concern also jury, uh, jurisprudence on the European uh, um, the European warrant, the European arrest warrant, uh, for which um, the Court uh, of Justice of the European uh, Union estimated at the end, since the reform um, on the public prosecutor status, status that I mentioned, uh, the public prosecutor was uh, more. Um, it, the French public prosecutor fit more in the uh, um, notion of uh, issuing judicial authority for asking for the execution of uh, EAW. Um, so going, um, going further, 
uh, I would like to uh, focus just on the criminal liability of legal person because that it's really linked with our um, dissertation concerning um, ADR tools um, engaging criminal liability of legal person. So uh, till 1994, French legal system didn't have provision um, engaging responsibility of legal person. That was the news of uh, introduced by the reform of criminal code, and it was at the very beginning, namely uh, included for uh, just a list of infractions um, expressed explicitly um, listed by laws or regulation. It was just in 2004 that criminal liability for legal person was extended um, to uh, was extending in general. Uh, by uh, law per uh, of uh, March 19, 2004. Uh, and it was also um, enhanced the rules on the accumulation of proceeding that allow so to um, address to legal person both fiscal and criminal sanction in our field of criminal and fiscal um, crimes. So nowadays we have mostly a problem concerning conflict of interest uh, in uh, representing in courts a legal person because nowadays um, there could be um, there are problems there are um, that could be uh, that could happen concerning the fact that legal representative of legal entities. Uh, are indicted at the same time for different facts or for alleged uh, offenses um, concern, that concern the um, company's proceeding. And so uh, the legislator um, until 2000, until 2000 uh, provided for a mandatory uh, court appointed administrator by court president for avoiding um, conflict of interest be, uh, between legal representative, physical person, and um, uh, legal entities who were indicted and in proceeding at the same time. Nowadays, uh, it's been um, already 22 years. It's um, there were there was a reform, and so this provision became optional and residual because it could be up. To the legal representative, to the physical person, to ask to be um, substituted by um, um, another um, another uh, an administrator, or it could be also the legal person during the criminal procedure that could uh, be represented in reality by every person with a delegation of authority in uh, during the criminal procedure. So it's really up to legal entities and to legal representative either to choose either uh, to be uh, substituted or not. So um, there's still some issues, controversial issues that could be uh, could have uh, some could be worth to to quote concerning also ADR tools. Um, so I would uh, also just outline um, the um, provision in the French legal system concerning the um, implementation of fifth directive at a domestic level. And in particular, just for uh, uh, my orientation, um, fifth directive was transposed in the French uh, system in 2019 by uh, an ordonnance. Uh, this ordinance, uh, this order, um, included and modified uh, lots of provision concerning um, fiscal and criminal uh, offenses. And in particular, we are talking about uh, repression of standard offenses and also crimes of breach of trust, embezzlement of public funds, corruption affecting revenues, expenditure or assets when relating to the EU budget or institution. And uh, the ordinance uh, also attached some aggravating circumstances of organized gang that really raised penalties to um, um, an higher, um, 
higher standards. And uh, so we have, for example, a breach of trust that uh, affect financial interest of European Union that from a penalty of five years of imprisonment in 2019, it was raised up to seven years of imprisonment plus um, a fine. Then um, I'll try to um, be more synthetic and I will talk about mostly of um, alternative dispute resolution tools on diversion. Because after the inclusion of the, oh, the, um, after the introduction of the European delegated prosecutor in uh, France, uh, we have also a um, really important point on the fact that, uh, according to French legislation, the European prosecutor, uh, the delegated European prosecutor, could apply also all the um, prerogative and skills that the criminal procedure code um, gives to uh, the normal internal uh, public prosecutor. And this includes also alternative dispute resolution main tools. And I would really like to talk about the, um, a part of legal translation that is a classical uh, tool. Um, I would like to talk about this convention. This convention is really interest, an interesting tool because it only applies to legal person and it's a diversion uh, measure that means that um, the fine that um, legal entities has to pay is not a criminal sanction and um, the conclusion uh, with the correct fulfillment of obligation uh, of the convention, extinguish the criminal, uh, the public action, and so it doesn't imply um, sentences for uh, public, uh, for companies and legal entities. And that's really interesting, uh, interesting also because in France, these uh, instruments was really useful for uh, recovery purposes and allows to uh, recover since his um, introduction in 2016, more than uh, three, um, million, uh, three uh, million of euros uh, in, really, in really few years. And it has to be considered also that uh, these uh, tools apply to corruption, uh, influence plannings, and uh, money laundering of connected infraction. And it was just uh, from 2018 that these uh, tools was also addressed uh, to fiscal fraud. So in really few years, it allows to progress in the uh, um, condemnation of legal entities um, in fiscal fraud uh, matters. And so it allows to uh, recover uh, lots of um, lots of money uh, for uh, uh, the French state. And I just want to uh, make a spot on some case law really briefly. And I'm really sorry it was too long. And for giving you uh, just a brief idea of the importance of this instrument um, is. Uh, I wish to, to, to talk about three examples of this um, convention. Uh, the first of all, uh, the first uh, concern Google, Google France and Google Island. So we had national financial prosecutor that um, mm, qualify uh, some uh, offensive carry on by Google uh, as complete as mm, uh, as a um, fiscal, uh, as a fiscal fraud, and uh, so it was a, a really uh, huge uh, affair that um, ended with a, a condemnation of a, uh, a fine of a really big amount. That we have also J.P. Morgan uh, that was included in an affair of complicity in fiscal fraud that was closed. Uh, by this convention by the public, uh, um, the um, National Financial Prosecutor. And then we had also another affair, really interesting, uh, the Airbus one that implied also a cooperation with the uh, Department of uh, um, Fiscal Fraud, the United States Department of Fiscal Fraud and the National Financial Prosecutor uh, of French Republic. And the affair was on bribery and corruption.
and thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, I hope if you have some remarks and observation that we will have the occasion for discuss it further later and um, for further information that will be uh, the, the edited report soon. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Marta Posito. It was very interesting, this overview upon French legislation. Um, I don't know whether somebody has some question for the reporters of this panel, for the speaker of this panel. Francesco, prego. Francesco De Angeli has a question. Uh, the Greek system, you, are, you have said that could be the model, considered as a model for other uh, member states. Uh, my question is whether the Commission uh, has examined uh, the legislation. Member states were supposed to transmit to the Commission the way in which they have applied, tra transposed the directive in their legal order by middle of uh, 1919. Uh, so uh, can you tell us uh, anything about the comments of the Commission on your legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, this is a, a very important uh, aspect of this uh, research because the European Commission has sent uh, a, a letter of, uh, um, I don't know how to call it, uh, a warning uh, to Greece. Uh, a warning letter. A warning letter. Yes, uh, a warning letter to Greece. But the uh, content of this letter is not uh, something that was uh, publicly available. So I don't know what uh, is the exact um, content. What is the exact point that the European Commission uh, disapproves regarding the transposition of the uh, Fifth Convention? So this is something to check regarding um, the completeness of our transposition. Because I had seen the, um, the announcements in the European Commission stage and it was among the a brief uh, announcement on warning letters on various countries. So I haven't seen a report yet. Francesco, you have to speak at the microphone, please. For, uh, yes, we'll see whether it's the people, or not. For the attendance <laughs> at home, you have to speak at the microphone, please. Now, my question is, my observation was that if the Commission uh, calls uh, the letter warning letter, it means that must not be very, uh, completely satisfied. Okay. Uh, I, just one final uh, comment on this, because you said I suggest it as a model. Um, it is not something that I suggest as a model. It's, I think that it is um, something that one could discuss. I understand that it may not, uh, because it has a lot of thinking behind it, and it has been structured in a way that it tries to be effective, although it tries to also to uphold some national standards. So I think it is worth discussing as a system uh, as a whole, because it is, um, it has specific reasons and choices. Thank you very much. I thank very much Professor Naziris, uh, Professor Janakoulas, uh, Dr. Saposito for their cooperation in this and their work for this uh, morning session. Uh, we are having now a short uh, lunch break uh, for about one hour, and let's say we resume our last session about uh, half past two, uh, so we wait for you uh, also online. Um, per quanto riguarda invece uh, l'uditorio online uh, che ha risposto alle domande uh, per raccogliere le, le presenze della sessione mattutina, uh, confermo che verranno riconosciuti i crediti anche per le sessioni di ieri, nonostante non ci siano state 
non ci sia stata la scheda di domande proposta per un disguido tecnico, eh, vengono comunque eh, verificate le presenze online e otterranno il riconoscimento dei crediti. Eh, ci saranno altre due domande proposte alla sessione pomeridiana eh, che saranno disponibili a partire dalle 13 e per le quali riceverete ugualmente 30 minuti di tempo per poter rispondere. Vi attendiamo più tardi, grazie, buon pranzo. Hello everybody, once again, uh, we are finally reached the last uh, part of this long in but interesting international conference and for the last part we have the conclusion the closing remarks. Uh, for this, I give the floor to Professor Mariangela Montagna. She is a member of the scientific board of the DRAMP project and she, in her capacity of professor of criminal procedure and also of European criminal procedures. She was so kind to accept the difficult task uh, of drawing the conclusions of this two days meeting. Uh, Mariangela, tell us your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. And first of all, uh, thanks, uh, many thanks. Uh, uh, to my colleague and my friends, Alessandro Lanciotti. I'd like to say many thanks for the big, great work that uh, she, has found, she has done uh, in this research project. And uh, I'd like also to say many thanks to Maria Mercedes Pisani, to Rossana Riccini, to Sabrina Brizioli, to all the people that uh, worked around this uh, project research. And uh, moreover, I want to say many thanks also to my Italian colleague and uh, to all foreign colleagues that uh, are here with us uh, to, to study, to analyze this um, interesting but uh, also very difficult uh, topic. So, um, to drive uh, the conclusion of this uh, research project uh, is uh, difficult. It's always uh, difficult to, to draw um, this uh, conclusion. It is um, more um, difficult in this case because, uh, as uh, you know, um, this research project has gathered more than 20 European countries. So I think that uh, it's not possible to report now in a short time and in short words, the results of the work uh, carried out by each individual state uh, that have participated to this research. The national reports, as you know, as Professor Salanciotti said at the beginning of this uh, uh, conference, the national reports of every state are published on the DRAMP website. And in that national, in these national reports, uh, we can find all the details. What uh, I intend to do now is to reflect to, to, together uh, uh, with you um, on some general notes which can uh, be applied to our research project. And uh, for this reason, I'd like to start from the beginning, uh, which is the beginning in our uh, topic, in our research. The beginning is um, the Council Regulation 2017 for the implementation and the establishment of European Public Prosecutor Office. And uh, we know that uh, the um, Union, the European Union, uh, wanted to create an area of freedom, security, and justice. And this area is destined to uh, operate thanks to European Public Prosecutor Office. The construction of EPO is the result of a long and complex path. And uh, with the Regulation 2017, the participating member states 
carry out a significant transfer of jurisdiction from national public bodies to a European authority. We have to note that uh, these transfers, this transfer of uh, uh, public uh, um, authority is very important. It is the second conferral of judicial functions in the history of the European Union after the establishment of the Court of Justice in 1957. And um, why, why uh, European Union has decided to create a public prosecutor office uh, European? And uh, this happened because in European Union, there is the will, a strong will, to protect the financial interest of the Union against crimes that uh, cause a serious financial damages to the European Union. And the EPO regulation, uh, we have to note that uh, at the beginning, the EPO regulation states in the introduction that currently the national criminal judicial authorities do not always carry out investigations and prosecute these crimes to a sufficient extent. For me, or from my point of view, this is the beginning of everything that we have dealt in this project research. Um, the EPO, so the EPO now is the responsible for identifying, prosecuting, the elders of crimes affecting the financial interests of a Union European. And uh, we know that we are uh, talking about PIF crimes, uh, known uh, as PIF uh, crimes. So um, the questions that uh, we have uh, to face is, uh, which are the relations between EPO and domestic law? Um, in the area of criminal procedure, the adoption of a uniform European legislation is expected to be impossible. There are practical difficulties and, above all, there are legal reasons. In fact, the European Union has limited legislative competence in the area of criminal procedure legislation. On the basis of Article 82, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty, the ordinary European legislator can issue legislative acts only in three areas, in three well-defined areas. These areas are the following. Mutual admissibility of evidence between member states, then rights of the person in criminal procedure, and then rights of victims of the crimes. And the consequence of this limited uh, conferral of powers to the European legislator in the field of criminal procedure is that the European Public Prosecutor Office will find itself operating in a legislative contest consisting of 19% non-harmonized criminal procedural law of each member state and 10% by law, national laws that transposing union directives. This is the fundamental starting point for fully understanding the highly derogatory and completely exceptional content of Article 86 of the treaty. And um, the first and crucial problem that European Public Prosecutor Office will be faced with the rules of law, substant, substant, substantive criminal law and procedural criminal law, is to be applied in the daily exercise of their investigative and prosecution function. And um, in, case, in the case of a future conflict of rules, the provision of the European regulation 
will prevail over the corresponding national rules of criminal procedure in application of the principle of supremacy of European Union law over the law of the member states. And so is, or it is in this perspective that we have to uh, deal with Article 40 of EPO regulation. We know that Article 40 of uh, uh, EPO regulation is dedicated to simplified forms of criminal action. In details, it is in Section 5 of this regulation, and the title of this section is more detailed, and it is Rules Relating to Simplified Procedures. So, it's, uh, um, it is a very significant example of concurrent application of the provision of the EPO and the national laws governing the same categories. In, um, in detail, uh, what Article 40 provides? Um, the delimitation of the areas of application of the two applicable law is clear. I'm um, sorry, I want to... Um, I want to read before it. Um, Article 40 provides that if the applicable national law provides for a simplified prosecution procedure aiming at the final disposal of a case on the basis of terms agreed with the suspect, the endling European delegated prosecutor may propose to the competent permanent chamber to apply that procedure in accordance with the conditions provided for in, for in national law. And then the permanent chamber shall decide on this proposal. And then if the permanent chamber agree with the proposal, the handling European delegated prosecutor shall apply the simplified prosecution procedure in accordance with the conditions provided for in national law and register it in the case management system. So, um, the delimitation of the area, I said, is uh, therefore clear because uh, I said it, uh, because in uh, first place, um, these simplified forms of criminal action must be provided in the criminal procedure code of the member state in which the, investigator, the investigation of EPO was conducted. And uh, it's necessary that uh, um, EPO, um, uh, follow the conditions of national law to apply one of these simplified procedures. In other words, we are talking about possible simplified procedure provided by, provided by um, domestic law that EPO can use to arrive to a definition of the uh, trial. I don't want to use uh, so much time, and um, so I arrive um, to the central questions. Um, our duty now is uh, to understand which forms of simplified justice are applicable in the case of criminal proceedings are um, initiated by the EPO on crimes with uh, its competence. I have used the, the expression simplified justice or alternative justice, and uh, it is a very huge expression. And uh, we know how it's important to uh, give uh, the right definition of uh, um, the specific form of justice that we want to use. 
uh, even more when uh, uh, different instruments and institutes comes from different countries, different uh, um, law, domestic law. Um, we know that uh, in the criminal trial and in uh, every uh, state, uh, there are uh, um, simplified procedures uh, such as plea bargaining or shortened judgment. And sometimes uh, uh, there are forms of uh, renunciation of criminal action, especially where the prosecutor has discretionality in uh, prosecution or not mandatory prosecution. And sometimes there are also form of mediation of uh, restorative justice. Um, article of, the Article 40 of the uh, regulation seems to refer to alternative forms that define the procedure before judgment. And um, first of all, I believe that uh, we have to do a first uh, disti distinction difference a first distinction to be made between negotiated justice and restorative justice. Uh, restorative justice is uh, so different from uh, or by negotiated justice. Why we say that? Um, because we can say that restorative justice uh, prefigures a path of reconciliation between the author of the crime and the victim. Instead, negotiated justice implies an agreement between prosecution and the defense. The objectives are different. Negotiated justice, such as, for example, the play bargaining, is motivated by a purely efficient perspective. Negotiated justice is a purely endoprocedural purpose, and it is always in a classic criminal procedural model survive, allowing to reduce the judicial burden. Instead, the model of restorative justice has its primary purpose the identification of alternative schemes to the classic system of criminal justice. And the goal in the restorative justice is to uh, make a recomposition, a reparation of the, of the conflict which, due the crime, was created between the author of the crime and the victim. And, uh, the essence of mediation is the journey, the shared path, the dialogue with therapeutic value and the recognition of the other. In other words, the goal of restorative justice is to transform the destructive effects of the conflict into an opportunity to coexist with the disorder. On the other side, the play bargaining include a negotiation. In short, these different characteristics are so important and uh, it's not possible to put uh, negotiated justice and restorative justice on the same level. They should not be assimilated at all. So in our Trump research, we have analyzed different situations of many countries. And as I said at the beginning of this, my conversation, it's so difficult to synthesize all these different situations in few words. What I can say now is that there are some general lines that emerged from the overall research. We have noted that there are forms of negotiated justice that exist in many domestic law of member states. And we have noted that there are recent forms of restorative justice. Uh, we can also underline that uh, in European Union is strongly urging or moving towards the implementation of restorative justice forms. Also in Italy, 
we talked about it just yesterday afternoon in the afternoon also in Italy there is a reform underway which aims to give more strength to the already planned institute of restorative justice so we can say that the restorative justice seems like a new um, perspective recent perspective and it is uh, um, provided in many countries in many member states of european union and so we have two paths the, before us uh, both valid both opportunity but uh, as mentioned before they are different in terms of goal and in terms of proceeding and uh, at the conclusion of this our uh, research and this uh, our work, uh, um, the, um, the hope, which is the hope uh, that we can say now in this occasion, it's likely to believe that uh, European Public Prosecutor Office is lending itself to favoring the process of European criminal integration by encouraging certain forms of approximation of national criminal systems, especially as regards to the statute of prosecutors and to certain types of procedures. It's possible that the scanty rules relating to the simplified procedures provided for in the Article 40 of the EPO regulation can stimulate the union, the state, the member state of European Union to harmonize and generalize the forms of criminal, um, so to harmonize and generalize the forms of preliminary agreement between the public prosecutor and the defense regarding the recognition of the accused guilt and the extent of the related sentence. So I think that uh, this is the auspicio, the hope that uh, at the end of this research we can underline. I finish and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much to Mariangela for drawing the conclusion of this uh, two days work. Um, um, just a few remarks and a recommendation. Per favore, puoi rimettere il sito e salire sopra dove c'è publications su su su. Okay. First announcement is that. Uh, you will find certificates of attendance to the conference outside at the desk while we go out. And we'll have a final short reception uh, in the same room we, where we had lunch with a final toast with some Prosecco and fruits for all of us to, uh, as a farewell uh, get together. Uh, my uh, recommendation is uh, for those of you who haven't done it yet, um, please send us the national report so that we will publish it on this website, uh, which I hope that will be uh, a means to facilitate the exchange of information useful to tackle fraud offences. And also, please um, uh, write down uh, the content of your own presentation, which will be published within the proceedings of this conference. Può cliccare sopra dove c'è scritto guidelines? No, so, uh, yes, the first one, the first one. No, no, quello, quello sopra. Scusi, il bottone sopra. Il primo, ok. You will find the guidelines for uh, drafting your article for the proceedings. No, publications, quello di prima. Perché diventa... Il primo. Yes, la PSI. Eccolo. You, you will find the template 
for uh, writing the proceedings on the website under publication. The deadline is the end of June this year because we would like to finalize our job uh, by the summer so to be able to present it to the relevant uh, European institution and so that they may use that uh, repository of information and perhaps they will allow us to uh, carry out uh, a follow-up study on this uh, research topic. Uh, so, once again, thank you to each one and all of you for being here with us today. Okay, basta, grazie. Um, and my recommendation is please do send us the final report and the uh, text of your article uh, for the publication in the, in, in the proceedings. So now we uh, say each other goodbye outside with a glass of Prosecco in our hands. And don't forget to um, take your certificate of attendance. Also, gli studenti possono prendere il loro attestato di partecipazione uh, and the speakers. Grazie a tutti. Thank you very much. It was a success. A special thank to Francesco De Angeli, who supported our research work and has been uh, very active during this two days conference. And finally, to our uh, Fonico, the technician Fulvio, who was so patient and so uh, quick in assisting us. Grazie anche a Fulvio. Grazie a tutti.